Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global. Our first hour is general discussion about things that uh, were, you're interested in, <laughs> your questions around media and virtual production. Uh, second hour is usually something we want to spend a little bit more time on this week, all week. We're, we're kind of restructuring some of the days uh, and how we're doing them for 2022. And so we're going to kind of brainstorm on each day what we want to see for this quarter and maybe even beyond. Um, so we're going to be talking about that uh, in the second hour and as and all through the week, what we want to uh, cover. Today, we'll be talking about business processes and what kind of things we'd like to talk about, NFTs and and processes and billing and all the other things that we might want to add and how much do we want to add to those things. So we'll talk about Mondays there. Of course, um, a couple of quick things we're doing. Uh, we have a special event in after hours at 10 o'clock on uh, Wednesday, um, I, I can't say a lot about it, but I'd probably want to be. You probably want to be there, especially if you like racing. So, um, so anyway, so that's coming up on uh, at 10 a.m. on Wednesday, um, media and racing. <laughs> so, um, anyway, so uh, uh, on. Also, we're, we'll be talking again. We're going to start doing breakout rooms in the after hours that will let you know what's happening. Wednesday, we'll be talking about building the birding show with Lois. And on Thursday, we'll be talking, of course, about Isadora. Those will be at 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time uh, or um, uh, 2200Z. So we're going to, you'll notice in our out, our stuff going out, we're going to start posting uh, times in UTC or otherwise known as Z. Um, so anyway, so that's going to be uh, going out. Uh, uh, most of our times we publish that way. Anyway, education is is also going to be on Saturday, of course. We don't broadcast the first two hours. We will start to broadcast the third hour of education. Um, that's going to be technical talks and interviews and so on and so forth. So that's new for 2022. Um, and to this, we'll, we'll have a deep dive into Keynote um, this Saturday at 10 a.m. All right, I'm going to hand it off to the host for today, uh, Liberty White. Take it away, Liberty. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone wherever you are in the world. Happy New Year for our first um, broadcast during the week of 2022. If you are watching, we encourage you to put your questions in because you drive the show and our panelists will do our best to answer them. And we're going to get started. Let's go, Bill. Absolutely. Good morning, one and afternoon and evening, one and all. Our first question this morning comes from Tony, Tony Mobley in Noonan, Georgia. He says, as a community embraces cloud and virtual machines, can the panel discuss the computing need for A10 minis or are we moving away from them? Leo? So the ATM Mini is actually a really good product, um, but when we're now moving over to cloud, uh, the big thing with cloud is you're looking at where you're getting your feeds from. If you're getting your feeds from two or three locations, then you don't need an ATM Mini. If you're getting two or three feeds in the same location, the ATM Mini is still a really good product. It just depends on what you're trying to do. Like anything, as the technology improves and changes, the needs change. And this is one of those ones where it really works in certain environments, but nothing is ever the one and only way of doing something. Guy? Yeah, I think that the uh, A10 Mini is still a great device for getting video in. You still need some way of getting HDMI in, so or SDI or NDI, you're going to uh, be okay. You won't need a device. And that's one where a physical switcher isn't going to be needed. So it just depends, like others have said, where where you're getting the feeds in from. So we'll do these uh, tests where we will run SRT feeds in. So I'll fire up uh, this Brady Bunch style uh, nine up where we'll just say, hey, you can take 9002, 9003, 9004. So that's like Dennis Champion Walker's uh, holiday uh, gingerbread house spinning there from the UK. But these feeds are coming in all over the world and uh, we just let people play. The bummer is that these SRT feeds take uh, about a second to show up. So uh, we're thinking that we can use something like um, Zoom as, as if it's a conversation for the real time conversation. And hopefully with Andy getting in there and you know all that's been acquired with Liminal, we'll start to see maybe higher end contribution, like maybe 10 bit, maybe 4K one day would be the dream. So. It just depends on what, what happens in the future. But for now, SRT is a great combination if you want the highest quality with uh, with real-time conversation with Zoom. And then there's also NDI Bridge, which is a whole other conversation. Maybe somebody should put a question about that, and we can chat about that one. There it is. Noah? Yeah, so when I think of the A10 Mini, I think of like what is the purpose and what does it accomplish, right? So um, more than three things, but the three things I'll mention, first, it captures a camera, right? Um, so you bring in inputs. 
Um, secondly, you can do a sub switch if you're on a bigger show, right? So you can switch between um, the straight on shot, an overhead shot, a picture in picture, that kind of stuff. And then it also takes the workload off of a computer if you did uh, multiple captures, like if you had multiple cameras, instead of having the computer do as much processing, it's in the hardware. Um, so Tony, ultimately, can the A2 Mini be replaced? Yes. Um, but because it does so many things um, and it's a very well-built, purposeful machine, I think it's here to stay for at least a little bit. Rupert? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's so versatile that I can't imagine many toolboxes that it wouldn't exist in. The exact uses and the ins and outs may change over time, but um, still very ver versatile uh, piece of equipment. Also, if we see, you know, Blackmagic um, explore the software um, defined switching market, we may see those ATEM minis being used as control, control surfaces for a software as a service type scenario. Who knows? Mm, that sounds interesting. Alex? Yeah, there's for larger productions and distributed productions, there's a lot of use in having it all done in the cloud. For something that I want to jump into a meeting <laughs> and do a presentation, or I want to do something really quick for my house, there's definitely uh, still a great value in hardware. Mitchell? I'm into the tactile. I like the buttons uh, on the uh, uh, ATEM Extreme. I like to be able to feel them and touch them and hit them. My mind seems to know exactly where to go. Uh, with anything on the, the software base, you have to maneuver a mouse around. It can only be in one place at a time. Until somebody has a uh, hardware controller for something in the cloud, um, I would stay with the uh, ATEM as it is. Next question. Next one comes to us from Rupert McRae here in the panel, Dallas, Texas. What do you wish you could do with an Elgato Stream Deck that you cannot do presently? David? Good morning. Uh there's a few programs that I run on remote systems that I'm having a hard time getting the stream deck to trigger certain things. A lot of them are keyboard mappings. So um, deeper libraries like that would be great for remote uh, control and stuff. Alex? More keys. I need more keys. <laughs> That's all I have to say. 64 would be great. I think a 64 key uh, uh, Elgato would be great. And Mitchell? Uh, global mic switching that's reliable. Um, I just don't like the idea that sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I can't trust it. Next question. Next one comes from Peter Moore in Auckland, New Zealand. And he says, in the early days of office hours, which became after hours, there used to be a breakout room with audio meters in it so that people could test things and invite others in to help diagnose issues. Can we please reinstate this? Alex. For the most part, we're trying to do that in the main room because it allows us all to learn from what people are trying to figure out. I think at first we thought, well, we're going to have some conversation. Remember, in the early days, we only had after hours or post the post show or the pre show for an hour. So if you wanted to diagnose something, it didn't really work because you're taking up an hour. Now we're open 21 hours a day. And um, the reason that we try to have people diagnose and learn is so that all of us learn with it. It became something that was uh, being used very casually for people to have lots of other conversations and the problem was is that it was leaving everybody else out and it was also starting to drain people from the main room now we are going to start adding more breakout rooms but those will be four sessions so scheduled sessions if you're interested in scheduling sessions let me know um, we're probably going to limit it to two a day no more than two a day um, so like wednesday has one at 10 a.m and one at 2 p.m uh, pacific standard time um, and um, and so uh, but we'll start to do more of those and those will be in breakout rooms but in general unless something's really dragging out or unless people are really into a conversation, um, we're going to try to do as much of that as we can in the general space so that we all learn. It's not like we're, <laughs> it's not like we have a programming uh, for after hours. Next question. Next one comes from Mitchell Hill in Wilmington, Delaware. And Mitchell says, now that 2022 is here, what media businesses has the most potential for growth this year? Rupert? I think the biggest area of growth from CES might be virtual events. I mean, if we look at the companies who are going, or rather the ones that aren't, they are all pretty much exploring virtual, you know, engagement options. So in terms of what might change this year and the areas of growth, I think that'll be a big one. Alex? I look at, I, I'm tracking three things, um, you know, for 2022 and 2023 is, one is, is exactly what Rupert said, is virtual events. We're seeing partners that are seeing 5X, 10X, 20X uh, attendee, a number of attendant, attendance numbers from what their physical events were. When that happens, even if you decide that the virtual event isn't as, as effective as a physical event, it only has to be 
half as good or a quarter as good or 10% as good. And then the ROI is still way higher than the physical event. And so and our, and a lot of our partners are starting to come around to that. Like they're starting to realize they're just, and they barely scratch the surface. It's barely working and they're getting much better results than they were before. Um, the other, another one in, from a media perspective is schooling and virtual schooling and virtual education. Um, we're about to go through a pretty heavy disruption you know, in education and the next five years will be probably the most disruptive in our lifetime as we shift to a lot of more online schooling. Um, that is going to provide opportunities for the folks that are um, prepared and uh, a lot of upset for the folks that are not prepared. So, um, so but what we can expect, what we should do is try to be prepared for that. And finally, 3D and AR. Um, Apple is most likely within the next two years going to unleash <laughs> something big. We don't know when, but we, but the rumors are now, um, starting to heighten up a lot. Um, th what that's going to do when we see USD, we'll, we'll know that the game is on when USDZ shows up in Keynote and, and Pages. And when that happens, we're probably less than a year out from a launch because they're going to drive a huge demand for 3D models. Um, and so, um, so Apple's built all the infrastructure to do that. Um, and now they just have to flip that on. But I would expect that Keynote will get USDZ somewhere between three and 15 months before AR is an AR device is released because it drives it will drive huge demand for the uh, the assets that are necessary for the AR pipeline. Leo. So we've seen the first mover in uh, uh, virtual events happening in the last couple of years, and we've seen that there's certain people who are at the front, and I'm not sure they're staying, seeing people are going to be there because there's the big players in other markets that haven't actually got their bits right so cisco is a good example they've got a platform but it hasn't been the big one in there and you and typically these guys take a little bit longer to get going and get moving into this area and i could see this change coming about and i can see that we are going to actually move away from this thing where people are saying well this is the new way of doing it or we want to go back to the normal and we were having this discussion on a uh, program last week on the synagogue tech program when we were talking about what is the new normal and is what where we are now going to be regarded as where we're going forward and i think this is going to be a really key part one of the things that i've seen work really really badly is i've seen people try and use some of these virtual platforms to replicate what they see on zoom to be like a, a more controlled version and actually what they do is they fall between the two posts it doesn't work as well as zoom because you don't get the interactivity of different people on the screen and it doesn't work well enough to be a broadcast because they miss the single biggest point of why these things work is that you spend money on the mics you spend money on the cameras so they end up with a poor quality version of zoom and that's the area that's going to be coming out so what i do think is that the hardware side is the bit that needs to be brought up so that the game that people play is actually going to look good and sound good and i know we've been talking about this a long time but i think that's still key that's going to change over the next year and ken yeah it's a um, mind thing to go by in this present well, last month anything to go by there's a big growth in people uh, moving to the um, rather than publishing on places like on Facebook or using Twitter that they're moving to owning their own um, content and publishing themselves. Um, seeing a lot of that movement away from the big kind of um, hosted platforms and and wanting to do it and own own it themselves and because they have a worry of either being cancelled or or um, uh, worried about what they say being um, not allowed on a particular platform, so they want to do it themselves, and that's been a seeing a bigger growth of that. Uh, I expect to see a big growth in that in 2022. Yeah, there were a number of crashes last year, social media platforms that went down, and that really helped people to wake up to recognize, okay, let's make sure that we've got our own platform firing on all cylinders. Alex. Yeah, I think that beyond whether you're saying something that gets you blocked or not, I think what people are starting to get tired of is the penal being penalized for linking to another platform. So if you put a YouTube link into Twitter, you're going to have a depressed uh, set of growth in your Twitter feed for a week. So, so those are the kind of things that people are getting tired of and why they're, you know, um, why they're, I think, one of the reasons that they're moving. It's not even that they're saying incendiary things. It's literally they're just getting penalized for sharing something from another platform. And, and that practice by the platforms to try to keep people onto the platforms is actually making the platforms themselves less palatable. 
Next question. Next one comes to us from Peter Moore in Auckland, New Zealand. He says the barrier for entry into our community via Discord is still constrained by the need to be here at 6.37 a.m. until 6.49 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And in case you missed it, there's no way of getting that URL. Apologies if that's not been addressed, but surely it's time to, if not. Rupert? I believe it still is the case that uh, it's a once a day opportunity to to get that link at a, at a certain time. It's it's a um a nice uh, it's it's you only need to do that once and you know it's probably just worth making the time to do it that one time. Alex, the secret to good communities is adding friction to the entrance entry. Like that is that's not something that I made up. That's not something that's made up. That's something that's been known for a long time. When you add friction to entry, you, you the what ends up inside tends to be better. Uh, you will not see us adding less friction. You'll see us adding more friction. As office hours, as we start to promote office hours in a wider sense, it will be harder to get into Discord and harder to get into after hours. We may we may reduce Discord, for instance, down to a day. You know, um, it just, uh, we, we want to constrain growth so that we maintain our culture. Um, and so, uh, so we will continue to, I pay attention to our growth across those two platforms um, very carefully. And so if we start to see it spike, you'll see me start to tighten it actually. So if you want to get into one of those things, I would do it now because uh, it'll get, someday there'll be a test. In, you know, in China, there's, there, there, there's a social network that literally requires uh, a hundred page, a hundred, hundred answers or something like that, that they, they have, you, you have to fill out before you're allowed to join. And it's one of the most successful uh, online communities in the world. Sky. Well, I'm, I don't think we'll ever have a hundred pages of questions, but Peter, no, I'm not, I don't like good. that. I know, but um, that's, that's, a, well, see, we've heard it here first, but Peter, I've, I've participated with you in uh, the Southern Hemisphere hour very late in my time, but the value of Discord is is huge. And what I look at is the the club membership, the athletic club membership of some kind, the gym. I continue to pay, but I hardly ever go. So I see this. Where is the value of this thing that you want? And I would say that Discord has a huge value. And I would hope that there would be a, a way to continue to, you know, find those people that want to be a part of that value. Next question. David Brady in New York City is in with New Year, New Skills. What's the best way to get started with Dante? Is VIA and the virtual sound card the way to go? Jason? It's certainly a great place to start. I would say, at very least, get one Audinate AVIO adapter and, and you know make use of it to, um, to, to kind of be your cornerstone. That's, that's my best advice. I, I don't really love VIA, but yeah, it's a way to start. Guy? Yeah, like Jason said, you really want a piece of hardware in on the system, not just going software. And then Dante on the site has some certification levels that are really nice. Um, I recommend jumping into their free uh, level one, level two, level three certifications, but don't mess around with not having at least one piece of clocking uh, hardware on. So uh, the cheapest Avio with XLR in, and then I'd get an out too, if, if possible. Alex? Just what Guy just said, the obvios are, are a great way to just add something to your system that's going to add a Dante clock. Um, I wouldn't, I don't know, our experience with VIA has been so bad. Maybe it's gotten better, but it's been so bad that I don't think I'd ever go back. Um, but the uh, standard Dante network is pretty good. Next question. Rupert McRae in Dallas, Texas, up next with any further news from CES. Sam. No, not that I know of, but they are running something online. Okay, Nigel? Yeah, Shapiro announced they were going to drop a day and actually uh, lose the last day of the show, which I thought was a, a frustrating thing for those who already planned their time because they're going to be stuck in Vegas however many days it is. Uh, they've also talked about doing more virtually online, as Sam said, but it's really incoherent for most of the people going and it's starting to get frustrating. I think if people were in and now they don't know where they are. Alex. Yeah. The news so far is that, is that the, we're at the record high of, of COVID COVID uh, uh, cases and we're starting a giant conference, global conference. I'm sure that that won't possibly go wrong. Uh, and then taking, turning a day off as Nigel pointed out, you have a bunch of people who are 
not going to follow any conduct and, and have a Thursday in Vegas. So it's, it's, it probably is actually making things worse than, than better for, for many people. Next question. Next one comes from Leo Mendel and Pinner in the UK here on the panel. Bar a travel ban, I will be snowboarding in 20 days' time. What's the current recommendation for a mic to use with the DJI Osmo to live stream? Alex? If you're live streaming, I think that then you do have to find a mic that's going to go in, and I actually don't know exactly. For some probably a Bluetooth um, type, type style. If, if you're using the Osmo um, with, the can with their phone, you know, you're going to not want something wired. So um, some kind of Bluetooth uh, trans, uh, transmitter is probably what you want to look at. If you're recording, I would re really recommend some kind of small recording system that you can record separately. So you're going to have NAT audio from, the, from your mic, but it'll have lots of wind and everything else that's going to go on. But you might have a mic or two that you pipe, do, go somewhere else and ha you have, there's a lot of ways to, you know, make sure that they're they're covered. They've got furries on them. They've got all kinds of stuff that may not be on the camera that you can um, that then then you can actually get great recordings that you can replace. So um, so I think that and and there's some ski resorts where are you do you, where are you skiing or where are you snowboarding? Uh, I'd be in Borovitz in Bulgaria. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I mean, the other challenge is, is there's not, oftentimes not as much cell coverage. Although I was able to stream from a helicopter uh, at the Matterhorn in the air. And it worked really well, surprisingly well. But but outside of that, uh, but but I wasn't you know wasn't down in in uh, in where you, the problem with it is a lot of ski resorts have limited line of sight um, to the to the cell towers, and, and it becomes more of a problem. Ken, yeah, DJI now make a equivalent to the Rode Go to make a wireless transmitter slightly only slightly bigger than the Rode Go wireless. Um, hopefully mine will be arriving in a few days so I can test it against uh, this one. But there's been really, really good reviews for the DJI uh, wireless equivalent of what the um, Road Go make. Maybe you can test that in after hours so that Leo can see in advance. Rupert? As a slight uh, sidebar, I remember when we talked uh, with Leo about this before, about live streaming on the on the snow and stuff like that, we were talking about Zoom to a cell phone. I think since then, we've seen the HD upgrade in Zoom from a cell phone at 16 by 9. So um, just maybe more actually viable to um, use your phone if you wanted to come in via Zoom uh, now rather than it was before. Bill? Yeah, the only thing I've ever gotten with uh, with using my Osmo to successfully connect an audio signal has been when I'm using Filmic Pro with it because they had something that managed to take in uh, a feed from my AVX system. But uh, other than that, it's a problem. So I'm just going to recommend you test a good little bit and see if you can find something that doesn't uh, stop that gimbal from operating due to wiring. It's a hard challenge. Next question. Joe Floyd in Gainesville, Florida says, any 2022 reading recommendations for building a small YouTube public access style studio? Books for small audio studios are plentiful, but is there a, uh, but there is a dearth of lighting and set design and so forth. Noah. I think it comes down to um, the medium that you're asking, right? You're asking for a written article um, or books. Um, I think with office hours, let me rephrase this. I can't recommend specific writings, but I can recommend in office hours we do um, breakdowns of smaller studios. I know Alex is building one now um, separate from office hours. Doug Johnson is currently building out his home studio. Um, so you can definitely pull a lot of ideas and concepts from those other places to um, add to your build out. Courtney? Yeah. <clears throat> Asking for a book is, is a bit strange to ask for a book on how to set up a streaming media studio because on YouTube, of course, there are thousands of instructional videos and, and sites like mentioned earlier, Doug Johnson and Aaron Parecki have done a lot of great videos on building out their studios and what equipment's required, how it's set up, how the lighting is done. Uh, so those are plentiful, they're free, and they're easy to stream. And if you're getting into the pub in, into uh, public access or YouTube streaming, what better place to find out about it than on YouTube? Alex? Yeah, I, I, I'd probably say that I think that this is probably the most informed group when it comes to talking about studio, smaller studios that there's, that's there. And so I think that what I would do is ask lots of questions. Um, we will talk more about studios on Fridays. And in fact, if you come this Friday, when we talk about the planning, we'll decide how often we're going to talk about it. Um, but we probably will talk about studios, home studios, larger studios, et cetera, probably once a month as you know, I think that 
studio design is probably something that we will um, take up relatively often um, as we go into 2022. So I, I, we definitely will cover it more here. I don't think, I'll be honest, I just don't think that there's a lot of great resources out there, and which is why we're going to spend more time on it. Uh, most of the ones that I read online, I, I, I at least I disagree with. <laughs> as someone who's built a lot of small studios, I mean, you know, over 50 of them, I I have definitely some strong opinions about it. So, um, so I haven't seen a lot of resources that I would recommend. Jason. Well, on the back of that, um, <laughs> Stephen Lampin has a pretty good pocket resource guide that is just a really, really easy way to, to understand what something is and why. Um, I would start with that. And Rupert? I would uh, just look for resources that uh, re remain up to date, you know, with anything that's printed or set in stone, it's almost immediately, you know, in terms of design or current concepts, particularly in this current, you know, time we live in, things just moving so quickly, you need to um, choose some resources that uh, are, are growing with the times. Bill? I'm just going to amplify what he just said and what everybody has just said. This is a difficulty because the state of things, I mean, take lighting, this, the whole migration over the last 15 years from all tungsten to all these LEDs and LEDs starting out so bad and getting better and better. There's just so much activity in that space that trying to figure out the exact best tools to use to modernize your studio and to work in these smaller spaces, the only place you're going to get that kind of information is in some kind of live interactive thing. And I agree with Alex. I think coming here and asking questions in after hours is probably your single best source of expertise and knowledge and or come on the show and and pepper us with questions because in the live real time you'll get a lot more help about what's actually working now because we're all using this stuff yeah that co-sign with bill and alex and just after hours because people have broken down and built up their home studios and studios overall and then you just also get a lot more time with people in after hours so come on back. Bill? Moving on to the next question. It comes to us from Douglas Carmichael. And he says, if I'm using a Heil PR40 or Earthworks mic with headphones, would it be best to turn original sound on at all times? Stefan? Well, in, in my understanding, it's not so much a matter of the, the mic. Uh, if you turn it on or leave it off, it's more a matter of how uh, noisy your background is. Uh, and that's where uh, Zoom steps in uh, with its adjustments. David? Yeah, I switched over to the USB version of that Earthworks mic. And when I pl plugged it in and everybody was like, oh, that's pretty cool, but try original sound. And it just picks up way too much of my environment. I just had to close the window because a cop car was going by. Next question. Next one comes from Jonas Dattel in Stuttgart, Germany. Has someone used StreamShark.io in the past? Alex? Yeah, StreamShark.io is a kind of a secret weapon for some very, very large, think um, uh, Fortune 5 kind of companies to handle some some back-end streaming. Um, so they're very, very effective at what they do and very technical. In fact, if we wanted to, we could probably I could probably get James to come on and, and uh, James Brober to, to come on and talk to us. Uh, they're out of uh, Melbourne. I've actually been to their offices. <laughs> so so, um, so uh, incredible team and uh, and very, very competent at what they do. And they again, they work on some some pretty mission critical stuff that they often can't talk about. So some of the stuff is on their site doesn't look as impressive as the company actually is. Next question. Mitchell Hill, Wilmington, Delaware, here on the panel. And with this question, is there a method for using a contact closure to toggle Zoom's mic mute on and off? Rupert. Sir. Some folks have uh, reported pretty good success with using the F19 key on a uh, keyboard to uh, to toggle Zoom mute. If that if that you find that to be the case, you can then get um, an X keys USB um, contact switch, a GPIO to, to USB that you can map those inputs to any keyboard shortcut you want. So in theory, you could um, wire that to an external switch or a contact into that USB um, controller and then map that to a key that you find to be successful in Zoom to uh, mute on and off. Then in theory, you could kind of put it together that way. Alex? Yeah, XKeys has a couple of different things. They have lots of control panels that you can push, but to what Rupert's pointing to, they have ones that have literally six eighth inch jack, 
you know, like literally headphone jack that are measuring closures. So you can have six of them going into a hub that has a USB into your computer and each one of them can be identified and you can set up different behaviors and very complex behaviors, not just a mute and unmute, but lots of other complex behaviors within XKeys. XKeys still feels like you went kind of back into the 90s with the interface, um, but, uh, but it is still pretty effective and cross-platform. Mitchell. Yeah, I'm trying to develop uh, a way to mute my mic without it being upstream of all the processing because if you just mute the mic at the front end, the process tends to go sucking up the uh, the extra dB looking for a signal. It's not there. Um, and the other modification I'm looking, I'm looking to go with Alex's suggestion of the studio technology 205. It doesn't have a contact closure yet. So I'm working on that. I should hear today on that one. David. Plus one on the X keys this is the X key 16 strip, and it's just the right size, fits right in front of the extreme ISO. Works pretty good. Guy? Yeah, I think that everybody else um, got it pretty good with the regular version, but I'm still using the good old Stream Deck. And uh, the, I just went and checked why my settings seem to work, and it looks like I actually found something kind of interesting. The Stream Deck mute button is actually in their hotkey one, alt A, hotkey two, alt A, and then it's on global. So maybe it's something about putting it in there twice. I don't know how I accidentally put it in there twice, but it seems to work every single time. So I would give, uh, I would give that a shot. You, you have a Stream Deck still, right, Mitchell? He says yes, he I do. Mm -hmm. Courtney? Yeah, the only problem that I have with uh, these keyboard, you know, generating the shortcut, keyboard shortcut generating devices is that it, uh, you have to have global shortcuts uh, for this to work because otherwise Zoom has to have focus and if you're clicking on your mouse other places and you're losing focus, like if you're clicking o over on the Makana to vote on a question or raise your hand, you're taking focus away from Zoom and so unless you have a global keyboard shortcut, uh, it'll miss it. And uh, global keyboard shortcuts are difficult and hard to believe because they override everything else. So if you're used to using a lot of keyboard shortcuts in your other programs, uh, it'll break those. So that's the problem that I have with it, of trying to find a global keyboard shortcut. And some people like they have that have the Mac uh, keyboard that have the F17, which doesn't appear on anyone else's keyboard. That's one solution around that because you can't assign it if it doesn't exist. Alex. Yeah, the, the 205 actually does have a contact closure built into it. So it's an eighth inch jack, just like the one we'd see in X keys. And inside of the ST controller, you have an option for con remote control input one, remote control input two, and you can build behaviors um, based on that. Um, so it, it is already built into the 205. Next question. Next question, TJ Asher comes up from Minneapolis, Minnesota, and says if special items will be in breakout rooms for after hours, will the same rules of camera on still apply when in a breakout room? Alex? No. <laughs> so you, you will, you'll be able to go in there and turn it off. And the reason for that is that they're, they're specific and those are, breakout, those are basic uh, breakout rooms that are specifically scheduled and specifically opened uh, for a conversation and some people just want to watch. Um, the main reason we did that was that there was a lot of just a lot of people hanging out with their cameras off and there'd be one or two people in there by themselves just having a conversation. And that was super uncomfortable when we first started doing it, when it was kind of ad hoc. Um, so that's why we had that rule that everyone had to kind of turn their cameras on. So you won't have to turn your cameras on for the scheduled events. Uh, if there's some kind of ad hoc breakout, absolutely, you need to keep them on. But if you're if we're talking about these scheduled events, which is probably the only time we'll use breakouts for a while, um, is uh, or or the only time it'll be sanctioned <laughs> anyway, uh, is uh, you'll be able to go in there and turn your cameras off because I think there's a real value to being able to just listen. Um, as someone now that listens probably 80% of the time that I'm in after hours uh, with my camera off, I feel like it would be uh, <laughs> hypocritical if I said there was some other way to do it. That's a good refresher for our upcoming uh, breakouts this week. Yeah, Thanks. yeah, absolutely. Next question. Serge Blondin in Montreal is up next, and he says, how many of the panel have upgraded their productions uh, max to OS Monterey? Jason? Um, with the exception of my brand new MacBook Pro, I've upgraded absolutely nothing. Uh, the MacBook Pro, the one that, that, that ships with it, it absolutely requires it to be up to date. Uh, everything else, nope, not in production. Ari? 
I don't know uh, how much this qualifies as uh, as an upgrade because uh, on my M1 Mac Mini out of the box, it wasn't Monterey, but I upgraded it immediately. There was nothing on it. I use it in production daily uh, for Zoom ISO. It's fine. And none of the memory leak uh, issues that were seen um, several weeks ago. So for me, it's great. Alex. Yeah, I, I upgraded a couple of my machines to Monterey. I won't upgrade anymore because of the red, the little orange dot that appears uh, in over top of everything. So there's an orange dot on the second screen over at the upper right corner, which I have right now. <laughs> so, which I can see at the moment uh, in my in my second screen. And um, let me see if I can, uh, I got lost in my mouse. Um, so, but that is the, um, you know, that's the problem that we have with it is that, sorry, I've got a bunch of stuff stacked up on it. I'll, I'll show it to you, but there's just, I'm just afraid I'm gonna create feedback here, but you can see in the upper corner, in the upper corner, uh, right, uh, upper right, um, you'll see a little orange dot and that is, um, yeah, that's there all the time when you're uh, with Monterey. So I would recommend until Apple fixes that to not use Monterey, you know, like to just stay with Big Sur. I saw your tweet after the New Year's after hours, and I was so proud of myself that I updated and everything. And I saw your tweet yeah. saying that you have stopped. So I'm glad yeah. this question came up. Yeah, it's 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 I I get where Apple's coming. They're trying to increase security and everything else, but it's a for event folks, it's kind of disastrously bad. Um, so I, I consider Monterey, and in general, Monterey has been not a great upgrade for me. This is one of the first time probably, I was so excited about some of the new features with Keynote and everything else that I upgraded a bunch of machines so that, that I could use those. And it's the first time I've upgraded in the first six months after Apple's released something and I'll never do it again. <laughs> like, like, like it's, I'm gonna let everyone test it from now Have on. Have you downgraded um, any machines that you- I'm upgraded? getting ready to. I'm gonna downgrade okay. a couple of machines back to Big Sur, um, but Monterey is not ready for prime time, in my opinion. I, unless you Unless there's a feature that you can't operate without, I would not go to Monterey anytime soon. Copy that. Mitchell? My production Mac is the old uh, 2010 5.2 uh, cheese grater Mac that's been upgraded to OWC, and it won't go above Catalina. So I don't have an issue with that. My M1, which is running Zoom, um, I did go to Monterey, and I do have an orange dot. I'm just pretending it's not there right now. <laughs> oh, Bill. Uh, well, I did Monterey too. When it first came out, I've been using it successfully and I, I don't do a lot of screen scraping. I don't do screen sharing. If I did, it would probably annoy me. But in just regular computing, uh, I've had a couple of customers who uh, I trust come over and work behind me and nobody seems to be bothered by it. So for me, it's been good, but it's an individual thing. Okay. Next question. Next one comes in from Tobias Moss and uh, I'm sorry, Noah Sargent in Fullerton, California from the U.S. here. How could we utilize NFTs, non-fungible tokens, for a media ecosystem? Alex. I think the big thing that NFTs provide, and we're going to talk about those in, in more detail as we go through this year, but I think that one of the things that they provide is the opportunity to, to guarantee an authenticity of a specific item. And so that could be um, now you can have virtual events where you're handing something out like a trading card or like a little trophy or like, a, a you know, all kinds of other things. And that thing theoretically is trackable as this is a original item of its kind. Um, so those could be providing, you know, souvenirs, um, what I what I tend to refer to as artifacts um, of the of your experience um, that you that you can buy only when you're there. So maybe the people the only time you can buy that NFT is when you're in that virtual event, you know, so that might be imagine a band and the only time you can buy a digital item from them is when you're in the in the you know there at the location. Um, I think also uh, one of the things we talked about over the weekend is book signings, um, you know, where you can have someone signing the, the cover of a book or the you know the cover of the image, and then converting that to an NFT and sending it to you as part of the like that. What you used to have is you used to have them sign the book, and then you so anything you think about of I went somewhere and I got something that is original to that piece. I think NFTs become practical, especially now with the advent of Polygon. You know, because I think that before that it was on, uh, you know, they were kind of unusable for little things. Um, and I think that we're going to see more people being more efficient um, uh, in, the, in the future to make that work. Next question. Tobias Moss is up next from Minneapolis, Minnesota. He says, Fish, P-H-I-S-H, performed in front of no audience except 70,000 YouTube accounts watching live. Did this New Year's Eve change how artists think about digital first concerts? Rupert? 
I think uh, plenty of artists are already embracing the, the digital first uh, model regardless. New Year's Eve is a tricky one, though, because you really at the last minute want that ultimately live, you know, actual live, you know, uh, moment. So, you know, I think there's a little bit of work there maybe to be done to to generate that in a digital first world, you know, at the stroke of midnight, exactly, with, with no latency and all that uh, kind of stuff. But I have to say that um, trying to... Uh, find some enjoyable coverage on broadcast uh, for New Year's Eve was uh, a challenge. Courtney? I don't know. I haven't heard too much from um, uh, artists, musical artists, about performing in front of an all-digital audience. But I know in sports there was quite a bad reaction to it because they didn't have the fans in the stadium. So they weren't getting, the performers on stage weren't getting the feet and the sports players of the game weren't getting the feedback from the crowd that they normally got and they didn't play as good a game or they felt not as motivated uh it sets up a different environment for the artist and i'm wondering in these seventy thousand youtube accounts watching how they got feedback from those fans since they're not hearing them you know shouting you know play Freebird," you know or whatever whatever the drunken audience is shouting out uh unless they've arranged for some way to feed that crowd noise back into the artist so that they get immediate feedback. Alex? Yeah, I think that um, one thing we have to know is that Fish, uh, that these are the, the OGs when it comes to streaming. They have been doing this for well over, I mean, like 20 years. Like they, they've been streaming in some version for a long time. So they have a very built up audience in a way that almost no other band has. We, t- we talked about Fish 10 years ago about how they had figured it all out and they have thousands of people come to their concerts at home. And so they've been doing this for a long time. I don't think they need the feedback because like a, like a movie actor has to be in, you know, in uh, who they are with tons of people that aren't even paying attention to them, moving around with all of this hardware and green screen and everything else, there's a, there are people who have figured out how to perform with or without the audience. And we've seen um, bands, many bands that, that I've had the opportunity to work with in the last two years play just as, just as well as I would see them on a stage in front of no one or in front of a technical crew. So the bands that can't do that, it's, it's really about their, their skill level in that new world than whether you can or can't do it. Um, that said, um, a lot of us have been figuring out ways to put audiences back in front of them, whether it's over zoom or, you know, like basically either individuals across it or, or venues or, or whatever in return. Um, and so the bands do get some of that response and you have to remember that that response, you can actually see people, um, when you're on a stage, uh, I've been on a couple of large stages when the audience is there and the lights are up and, uh, it's really hard to see almost anybody. Like, you, I mean, there's a lot of people out there and there are time, moments when they when they light it up that you realize you're in front of a lot of people, but you're not you're playing to, you know, a, a, a much less known thing than it than it feels like, especially at the scale of a stadium or something like that. So I think that um, the big thing is, is that uh, bands are going to learn that they can make a lot of money streaming straight to their fans over time. And at the end, in the end of the day, they'll want to play a lot. They won't want to do 70 shows. They'll want to do 10, you know, 10 shows in front of real people. And then they just want to cash in, you know, because uh, as someone who's worked on a lot of these, it's grueling for the bands. Like the bands are really excited somewhere between 10 and 15 are, is their best shows. And then after that, it's just a slow wind out, you know, for them. Bill? I'm just concerned, and it's a very minor concern on my part, but I, I kind of hurt for the artists who are great artists and great creators, but who don't sparkle in terms of their presentation. Um, and I think it's maybe the thread that we saw in uh, Lady Gaga's A Star is Born, where somebody who is tremendously authentically talented, but at the end, that last scene where they put her on a TV show with dancers behind her and everything kind of really hurt my heart. And it was like, man, you're turning that performer into something else for the needs of the money machine. And I just hope there is still a way that the quiet, unassuming, not projectable artists get their due as well as the ones who are fabulous on YouTube and light up the screen. Tobias. Um, So of course, yes, Fish has been streaming for a long time and at high quality, but this was the first one where there was no one around. So if they chatted with each other, you got to hear every word. And it kind of gave that feel of like watching the Get Back documentary of, oh, I'm like, I'm friendly with these guys. I can hear how they banter between tunes just for themselves, or is it for me? And there was one special moment um, where Trey made some reference to Betty White 
having died and everyone in the band already knew except for Fishman, except for the drummer. And so you got to see that like live reaction um, to hearing news. And so it just had this an, an extra level of live than even streaming a live show doesn't have. So that's why I brought it up. Thanks. Thanks. Next question. Next one comes from Rupert McRae in Dallas, Texas. According to an article in Forbes today, Goldman Sachs, City, and J.P. Morgan are amongst the latest forms, firms excuse me, to push back their return to office plans. Could a reason for this, uh, this is even possible, be that remote work has actually proved to be successful? Leo. So any change to big areas uh, cause people to either want to go back, contract, or they want to push forward. And this is that break point where we're at at the moment, where we're looking at it saying, should we have, is the thing that we did in the past, the norm, the right thing to be doing? Is the right thing to be doing getting people to commute an hour each way to go backwards and forwards into the office just so that they can be sitting at a desk that is costing an absolute fortune per square meter to be actually uh, serviced? Does that work? It did work when you went from a factory location because you needed to be in the factory because everything you needed and it was there. We're now in an environment where everything you can actually need to do your job in certain roles can be supplied from home and you're not having to commute or, or even more importantly, you're not having to restrict the people you choose to work in your company to be in one geographic location. They can be anywhere in the world to fit and do that job the best way possible. So they are pushing back but i want to not say that's the new norm i don't want to go back to the what that people think was the norm i want to go forward to what is going to be the new way of doing it and that will be less and less companies filling up really expensive office space in downtowns mitchell i agree with leo um i want to add to that a little bit and that is how do we measure the success of whether we do that or not and it's not necessarily going to be measured by chase and Sachs and other companies like that's going to be measured by the employees and the people that have to work in those spaces. And um, I think the dramatic difference now versus before pandemic world is that if people don't like the decision, the, com the company that might hire them, they're going to go to work with somebody that does agree with them and says, okay, you can remote work. That's fine with us or work three days at home and two days in the office. So I say the success is yet to be determined and not necessarily by the big boys. Alex? Yeah, I think that uh, the, the, I think the reason they're pushing it back right now is not because it's success, because COVID is peaking and they just don't want to be dealing with the, um, the liabilities of forcing people back uh, to make that happen. It's people are better or safer at home at the moment. So I think that's probably why they're doing it. I do think that they are, they seem, a lot of companies seem to be help, you know, bent on pushing people back into the office and for smaller companies that have figured out how to do remote, um, uh, you know, and have remote employees, uh, this is a huge market opportunity for them um, because it creates disruption and allows them to take advantage of the fact that employees that would normally only work for large corporations are now ready to go some work somewhere else. I have a lot of friends who used to work for, um, you know, big companies who have moved to smaller companies because they're allowed to live wherever they want, you know, and, and it's been worth making a little bit less, not a lot less, just a little bit less so that they have a higher quality of life. And so I think that that's going to be um, something that we see more and more often. Courtney? Yeah, investment companies are the one class of company that has difficulty with moving people to remote because most remote people don't have the high-speed internet access that is required for this high-speed microsecond trading uh, that is done. And I think when they move people out to the remote, you know, their remote terminals, they're losing losing an edge and so they want to have them come back into the office but uh, like alex said it's the liability that they face of an inspe infection spreading amongst their uh, you know in their office that that they're facing is why they're pushing it back yeah that's the key word liability nigel yeah as ever i say pity remember there are those who cannot work remotely that some of us have to go places to do things but i think the most interesting long-term thing post-covid will be the emergence of sort of cells rather than large companies moving to regional spots. And I think you're going to find people won't want to commute an hour and a half into San Francisco or into New York or into London, but they might do a 20 or 30 minute commute into Austin or some of the other more regional hubs that are going to grow up around this. Next question. 
Next one comes from Peter Moore. He's back from Auckland, New Zealand with, has anyone had a chance to look at the Teradex Spark 4K as reviewed by Alex Pettit here? And then he's got the link. Thoughts? Noah? Yeah, I did get to look at it a little bit. Uh, a couple things. So Teradex is obviously the main um, primary brand, generally speaking, as far as wireless um, transmission goes. They do have a product above that that's called the Teradex Bolt 4K. So that's the one I'm used to using. I have... Uh, one for my company. And so that's been extremely reliable um, with certain caveats. And this also probably applies to this smaller, uh, better priced unit. Uh, the first thing is the distance, like it might be advertised, the, that unit you're looking at is 500 feet, mine is 750. So I would cut that in half and just know it's line of sight. Um, the reason for that is using a five gigahertz transmission. Um, and so the, that's basically really tiny frequency waves that don't penetrate very well. And I, I think in Aaron's review, he mentioned he did go through a wall. Um, but basically, if you go through a wall, I would keep it under 50 feet. And I wouldn't even go through walls if you could avoid it. Um, the other thing that I noticed is it's HDMI only. So you don't have SDI. Um, and yes, the latency is very, very good. Um, but uh, the other thing I meant, uh, noticed too is with B&H reviews, uh, a couple people noticed that out of the box, it does not work. So it needs a firmware update right away, which is kind of odd. Mm. Alex. Yeah, the, the we've I've owned a lot of bolts and uh, rented a lot of bolts. So I haven't used this one. Um, I will say that the, in general, everything that Noah said is, is accurate in the sense that you want to be much more conservative. I don't know if we've ever thrown a bolt longer than 150 feet, <laughs> you know, like ever, like, like had it re require it to do that. And generally we're at 50 feet or less. Once we get into a hundred feet or more, we go into larger transmitters, um, you know, to make that work. That said inside of that space, super effective, uh, cost, of, cost effective, um, and so on and so forth. We don't rent bolts anymore because it's so easy to put them into states that they don't, <laughs> that are unrecoverable, that uh, we own them. Uh, I've spent days trying to get bolts up, you know, that that were, um, that were we that we went somewhere at a distance and just couldn't find one to work. So I wouldn't rent a bolt, um, but, I, uh, but, I, but I would recommend. Uh, the Teradek overall has been really successful for us. It's just that they're a little tweaky. Next question. Next one comes from Emmett Williams in Washington, D.C. And Emmett says, I'm a documentary filmmaker, usually editing one large and a few smaller projects. I got the M1 Mini before getting the M1 Max MacBook Pro. If I don't need an Alex-style render farm, is there another way to use the two machines together? Alex. For me, it'd be all about render time. So even though you're not building a render farm, having another machine to render some of your graphics, and if you're going to ever do anything with motion that requires, you know, a little bit more time to render, or After Effects, or um, or Cinema 4D, or other things that that may add a little bit of value to what you're doing, uh, having another computer to work on, or even when you're doing exports, having another computer to work on while you're exporting, super useful. Chris. I think one thing to keep in mind, Emmett, I'm sure you've thought about this, is that the beauty of having a second machine is really only useful if both machines have access to all of your media. If you're cutting a documentary, you know, what are you doing gigabit? Do you have a 10 gig network? There's a lot of infrastructure that has to be put on that. Uh, you may consider just you know, even at the lowest level, just having a second copy of all your media, that may help you. But I will tell you this, uh, this is something that I've learned recently from the group here, mostly Preto taught me. There's a utility called, um, what's it called, John? Synology or Syn? It's a, it's a mouse control thing. And essentially what it allows you to do is to take your mouse and your keyboard and seamlessly slide it from having control of one computer, whoosh, over to control of a second computer. I actually use my one mouse and keyboard to run my laptop, my Mac mini, and my uh, iMac Pro. And it's totally worth uh, checking out. Come by after hours and ask about it. But I'm sorry, I can't remember what it's called. Uh, actually, let me look it up here. It is called Synergy, and I can't remember the company that makes it. It's a mouse utility, very powerful. I'm using Dave. it actually right now, and and it is amazing. It there's every once in a while it gets into a weird state, like it just doesn't like I can't see the mouse, like but it's like once a day I can't find my mouse and I just wiggle it a little bit and it shows up, but <laughs> but outside outside of that, 
I have mo multiple computers and monitors and I just kind of keep moving my mouse over to where I need to get to one. And it's, I, I did it because of a recommendation from John Preto and, uh, and, and Twit uses it. And so I'd heard about it a lot and I just hadn't used it. And John was so excited about it. I was like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and turn that you on. You do have to really open great. its control window and then hit the little yellow dot on your Mac and just, just make it go away because it does need to be open all day. Yeah, but it's but it, it's creepy. <laughs> it works. I I had a you know um, a KVM and I just this works way better. Synergy works really well. David, yeah, one pro tip for the lost mouse thing: there's a way you can map keyboard shortcuts to put the mouse on any which screen that you might need. I use that all the time. I plug use it between. Use it between Mac and PC all the time. It's good stuff. What? Next question. Next question comes from Lois Richter in Davis, California. And Lois says, what kind of service is stream underscore voodoo? And how do you use it in your works workflow? Alex. Uh, I, I can't say how much I can t talk about it yet because I'm testing. I'm, I'm probably a couple versions ahead of everybody, uh, but I'm testing Stream Voodoo, Voodoo a lot. It's a really impressive pipeline. So it's really designed for people who want to do high-end broadcasts and be able to integrate other people at a high resolution um, and really, you know, um, and have a lot of control. So you can actually control. Uh, it's it's kind of like having a Zoom session, but you can control your different um, compression settings and resolutions. Every person can use a different one and do what makes them the most sense for what they're doing. Um, and then there's and there's a lot of features that I, as I said, I'm, I'm not sure what's in the current version, so I can't get too far too deep into that. But it's um, uh, it's a really really powerful tool that has. If you need, if you always wish you had more dials <laughs> to turn on Zoom to affect your color and so on, or not affect color, but affect your resolution and quality and everything else it has all the dials um it is a little bit heavier to use just because it's not quite as automatic but it's a if if you're looking for a kind of a really interactive like how do i pull people together you can choose different things to send into the scene to to other people it's 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 a it's very different than zoom and very powerful Hi. Yeah, as Alex was saying, it's it's the contribution method really is what it boils down to. It's kind of like Video Ninja. And if you've watched Tony's show, you can see that we get a little bit crispier image. It just, it, it appears sharper and there's a little bit richer color. And that's one of the things that you can do with the this codec is um, Dead Mouse, the, uh, the musical performer got into this because he saw that a lot of the gamers were starting to use this because it, it evolved out of a need, which is always a great way to evolve a product. So, you know, gamers running 60 frames per second, 4K, uh, and then wanting to up the bit rate so you can do 4K and you can use the VP9 codec. So the VP9 is resource intensive. So like when Chris Clark came on to Tony's show, it was a mess because he was running an old machine. So we found a way of, of lightening the load, but unfortunately it involves dragging other people down. So if you have fast machines, uh, Stream Voodoo, especially they're coming out, as Alex said, there's some beta stuff that's really cool. So um, it, it's exciting. Keep an eye on it. Awesome. Next question. Next question comes from Lois Richter in Davis, California. If somebody who cannot speak wants to participate in a speaker's panel, what text-to-speech app might they use? Alex. You can, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know if I'm set up to show it right now, but you could literally open up um, text edit you know, on, on, a computer, on, a, on a Mac and just literally say play this and it'll play that play it out so you could type something in select it and hit play and it'll just play it so what you'd have to do then is what i'd probably do is use something um something to route that audio output into you know the mac audio output or whatever output into back into zoom or back into the presentation that you're doing um so like using something like loopback to grab onto the audio and send it back out again so um but it's literally that simple nuance makes other engines and other um apps that you can also use to do text-to-speech. Um, and a lot of these are getting to be exceptionally good um, at playing those back. And in some cases, um, with some of the voices, it, it can get very close to not not knowing. <laughs> um, they, there's higher-end solutions. So Roger Ebert um, really kind of helped pioneer some of the really high-end solutions where they analyze all of your vote. You actually read a whole bunch of things. before. This is if you if you haven't lost your voice yet. So Roger Ebert had the, he had an opportunity, he had a lot of things that were already in public domain. So they were able to model the voice that he created from uh, his own voice. And so that's also possible as well um, for folks who haven't lost their voice yet or have 
recordings of enough recordings of their voice that they can um, they can actually model the in, in the same way that they model Siri or other things. Next question. Next one comes from Douglas Carmichael. He says the Earthworks Icon Pro has a built-in filter, while the Earthworks Ethos uses a traditional windscreen. Which of the two would be easier to keep clean? Bill. Well, I so having done voice work for for decades, I don't think I've ever had to clean a mic. And I think if your technique is good, you're not really kind of spitting or or working right on a thing. Uh, keeping it clean just for yourself is not really an issue. Now, I know if you're sharing mics or working in a studio or something like that, and with COVID and things like that that have come through in the last couple of years, uh, disinfecting mics has been a little bit of a thing. Uh, I tend to do when I'm in that kind of circumstance, either something external that I can clip on like a pop filter that can be removed and cleaned and brought back, or at least use some sort of Lysol spray or something between people. But if it's just for yourself, unless you're really bad with plosives and spitting a lot, I don't think I've ever had to clean a microphone for a decade. Mitchell? I could speak for myself. Uh, when I worked in radio, we used to have inherit the same microphone from the guy that was on before you. And if he was a smoker or if he had just had lunch, you get to see what he had for lunch at dinner. It's not good. It's a mess. Uh, try to go with your own foam or your own microphone. And David? Uh, the Earthworks Icon, it's a pop filter built in, screws on stainless steel. The Ethos has a bigger element and it's more of a foam windscreen that's fits over the whole thing of it. So, uh, and there's a considerable price difference between the two as well. So keep that in mind, but just keep it clean either which way. Okay. We're going to go over just a little bit to wrap up these questions that we have before we jump into our second hour. Next question. Tobias Moss has one of the last few here with, uh, for purpose of singing and speaking on a stage, comment on the Countryman E6 versus the DP4088 or other options. Alex. I'm mostly interested, I'm mostly familiar with the uh, H6, which is the full headset, um, which I would recommend, or the DPA4066. I'm not as familiar with the 4088. Um, I will say that the DPA will, um, have a little bit more bass response, in my opinion. Uh, it looks a little bit larger, but it'll have a little bit more bass response than the Countryman will. I, I own both of the, the 4066 and the H6. Um, the one that a lot of singers use is actually made by Crown, and I can't think of the the name. It's about four or five hundred dollars, and it's a uh, maybe five hundred dollars, and it's a. I know it sounds odd that Crown would make a headset that we'd all use, but but I think that um, that is the one that Garth Brooks and a lot of other. Uh, singers swear by will not use anything else other than the, that that one and it's got a much larger diaphragm so it's not as low profile um from it but it, it i'm told that it sounds really good i've been keep on trying to think i should buy one and or test one you know to test but i just don't just haven't had the the, the available resources to buy something that i'm not sure i'll use all the time to cm311 oh yeah there you go cm311 guy yeah, what Alex said, but also adding in uh, that there's in the Discord, uh, the Office Hours Discord, there's a microphone section, and I just put up a uh, diagram from the DPA site, which shows some interesting stuff about the placement. So if you look at the third and fourth ones down, the microphone is placed on the on the very top of the head, and this is what we're seeing in a lot of Broadway plays these days, is there, the placement of the microphone greatly uh, changes the frequency response. So if you noticed here, uh, traditional head-worn mic uh, down by the mouth has this kind of fall off like this where you can see how much more clarity you can get at the head so i'd be looking um not only at, at the mic manufacturer but uh place of placement of the mic they're going to be singing keep those diagrams of mic go on the uh, dpa website and and just read up and understand really what you're doing and watch some youtube videos of what's going on and how they're miking uh performers that are doing this every day so they're doing it at the highest level obviously next question Next one comes from Mitchell Hill in Wilmington, Delaware. He says, I wanted to extend my Shure SE215 earphone wire to the longer version it came with and terminate it in a quarter inch plug. How to do that, I guess. Courtney. Uh, well, I would never suggest cutting that wire, cutting the connector off and adding a new connector to it because those little headphone wires uh, frequently, especially the small diameter wires that are on those Shures, a lot of times they're made out of steel. And uh, it's, I mean, if you've ever tried to solder steel wire, it's extremely difficult. So uh, I'd avoid that and just get an extension cable that goes eighth inch to quarter inch and 
and do that. Otherwise, you could just buy that same uh, headphone as available in a wireless version. So you could get hey, that as well. David. Weeks back here on Office Hours, somebody mentioned Angry Audio, and I looked through some of the products. They make this thing called the Headphone Disconnector. It's a MagSafe doodad. Goes from eighth inch to quarter inch there. Additionally, they have a product that's a desk mounted thing called the Disconnector Buddy or something like that. And you screw that in. You can see here it's then connect quarter inch out. So you would put your headphone into the little MagSafe end on this end, connect it into the table mount thing, and you're good to go. No modifications necessary. Next question. Uh, Douglas Carmichael's up next. He says, many productions have used NASA sound effects, comms, the countdown narration to build suspense. Where do you think that came from? And would a second hour with Preto about high powered model rocketry have an audience? Alex. Yeah, I don't think I would probably use something that was found, but I think that a lot of times you can pay, you can learn a lot about checklists and process and everything else from listening to NASA. And I think one of the best examples where we see a full sample of it is probably in the 70 millimeter release of Apollo 11, um, the Apollo 11 documentary, you just hear this great cascade of the launch and it is just, uh, it's magical. So hopefully uh, we'll, uh, we'll see more of that. Go ahead. Sam? Uh, yeah, building on Alex's comment <clears throat> about Apollo 11, NASA also did a huge project to, um, to, Move on. I'm blanking all yep. of a sudden. No worries. Okay. No problem. Chris? Um, I know that s much of the footage that NASA created, because it was made with taxpayer dollars, is actually open source and available uh, to use. Like, for example, if you, if you know where to look, you can find these great time-lapse footage stuff like from the space station that's just posted online. And you are free to use those in your productions. I'm fairly certain, not a lawyer, double check, but uh, we paid for it. It's ours to use. Next question. Elliot Robinson in Las Vegas is up next. He says, please put a link to Jason Bache's AV book. Jason? All right, uh, Elliot, you got it. So um, it, it's in and out of print, and I'm not sure if the ebook is exactly the same. So what I'm going to do is put the ISBN in Makana. Thank you. Next question. Jens in Sandpoint, Idaho is next and says, Alex, what interface are you using to send surround out of your Mac to your JBL speaker array? Alex. Yeah, so I'm setting up a um, an RMU for that so that I'm going to be using, to get to the speakers, we'll be using an X32. But the processing um, via Dante will be through an RMU that I'm building with a Mac Mini. <laughs> so, so that's uh, that's how I'm, I'm putting that together. I don't have it running yet, so <laughs> I'll tell you if that's the way it turned out. But um, all the speakers are uh, all the speakers that I have are self-powered, so it's just XLRs to all of them, um, which makes everything easier or in a lot of ways. And you can you can that's that's the easiest way to do it with the uh, the equipment that you have there. So what you'll probably want to research is the Dolby Mastering Suite. Next question. And Peter Moore is in with the last one for this section. Has Mr. Preto and the rest of the space crew thought about engaging the everyday astronaut guy to help get extra coverage? His 1.1 million subscriptions may also help office hours. He has a link there. John? Very interesting you said that, Peter. I looked for you on Discord because I'll add you to the channel that we have. So the server we have set up in Discord, we actually enumerated the top five rocketry guys and we're reaching out to them to let them know what we're working on. Thank you. Sky. Just been a lot of fun to see people's imaginations really get excited and participating in this experience. What I'm going to throw into this, though, is what is it that you want to bring? And again, to Talalik's point, what joy do you expect to receive from participating? Because it's not all up onto John's shoulders that all of this magic is going to happen and or any one individual. But as we collaborate and work together towards doing a thing, um, I just I, I, I bring that piece of uh, observation in doing projects with large communities of volunteers. And uh, I look forward to participating in maybe a lot of other people. All right. Well, that wraps our first hour. And I'm going to toss it over to Alex to get us into the second hour. So, yeah, so what we're doing this week is really thinking, I mean, it's really for the whole year, but we'll probably keep on coming back to this every once in a while. I probably won't do it for a whole week. Um, but we're restructuring a little bit of the of the second hours um, to kind of help us uh, 
uh, adjust to a, a lot of different opportunities. And so, um, so basically, to kind of break it down, um, on Mondays will really be business ideas. So, like as a business owner, you know, at, what are the opportunities for us to jump into? What are the things that we might want to know? So, again, one thing that's been very popular that a lot of people are talking about is NFTs and and cryptocurrency and crypto in general, but also how to run our business, how to bill, how to, and we've split those, those have floated all over the, the different days. And what we're going to do is push a lot of those to one day, which will be Mondays. Um, so a lot of the discussion today, will we can kind of, kind of t discuss that. I'm hoping that someone will take notes because if I, if we're in this, I'll try to take some of the notes, but it's really good. And it's really good to use the second hour suggestions. Um, but what, you know, what we're going to do is try to really plan out the next quarter. And so we want to think about the kind of subjects we want to talk about. Um, go ahead and put those in as questions, uh, at, you know, is from a suggestion perspective. Um, but, um, but think about those. I think that we're probably you know, unless people push back a lot, we're probably going to talk about NFTs and crypto at least once a month. And a, and one thing to think about is uh, one of the things, I won't do it all the way through, but one of the things I'm trying to figure out is how to think about each day as um, monthly user group meetings. <laughs> so, so, you know, like there's a different, there's like four different subjects that we may cover or two different, you know, like there's different, we try to break these up into lots of different little bits and pieces that we can cover there. So, so like, so think about 20 different kind of user groups, but they fit into different things. So, you know, like one week might be NFT, another week might be running your business, another might be media opportunities or whatever. And we kind of talk through, you know, those types of things, but it happens that way every, every month. Um, so, and I'm open to suggestion, but, and this is a good time to do it. Um, but, uh, but anyway, so that's, that's something that I'm, um, you know, kind of looking at from a structure. So, uh, Monday is again business. Tuesday, we're going to kind of combine audio and video together. So we'll kind of go every other, um, you know, for that. And then Wednesday, we're really going to look at more of the visual effects, animation, 3D, so on and so forth. We'll have, you know, more of that. We, it's something that I think we need more of in our group. And uh, and so and second hours help drive kind of who sh who shows up. <laughs> so so I think we want to do that. Um, and then Thursday is really artists. It's not going to be technical. Thursdays are about us getting back to the like what, you know, why we do this. So it'll be music artists and and authors and speakers and, you know, all kinds of other stuff. But it'll just be, you know, a thir Thursdays will be more of an artistic uh, view of things. And then Friday is really designed as nuts and bolts, you know, like really just how we, you know, how do we get equipment in and out and how do we wire things up? And most likely that's where we talk about studios and so on and so forth. So, um, so anyway, that's it. And then of course, Saturday's education and Sunday is now cooking because <laughs> there's no, no real day off. So, um, you know, so the cooking will all be moved to Sunday. Uh, we, we tested that over the last year um, and we'll be doing it. So Sunday at 10 uh, will be there. That's giving us more room for things like the Belfast method on Saturday, um, and wherever, you know, wherever that goes. So where, no matter what we're going to do, we're going to hold that space there, um, for, so the Saturday at noon, uh, we're holding on to, and then, um, education will expand by another hour to support, um, a technical and streamed support, um, uh, event on sat every Saturday. And so, um, so those, are, those are kind of the, the trajectories of a lot of the bits and pieces of that. So anyway, so we'll go back to, um, to business and, uh, and what we, what we want to, um, actually talk about and let's go ahead and jump into the questions. Our first one looks like it comes from John Snyder in Reno, Nevada. And he says, how do you manage remote hybrid on-site teams differently? Super. There's um, a lot of different, uh, points of view here. I'm sure I'm just going to take a, a view at this from a HR corporate perspective. Well, and, and I think, I think what we want to do is, is I think for planning, we want to think about, and we can talk about this to, to some degree here, but I think what we're looking for from, from folks is, is to talk about it in context of, should we create it a day, you know, a second hour? Cause I think that probably that's a second hour, but go ahead, Rupert, if you want to jump in. But when we think about how we answer these as panelists for this hour, it's really thinking about, are we going to make a second hour out of these questions? Yeah, I, I do think this is a wider um, topic because coming at it from a, um, looking at it from an, a corporate perspective, maybe at an HR level, really and truly, there should be no difference. In fact, if there is a difference, that's part of the problem right now is you get into this equality 
um, you know, disparity between working at home, working remote, whatever, in terms of how people are managed and how and work is distributed and, you know, all of those, how expectations are set. If you look at the advice coming out of the big HR firms, the HR think tanks, all those folks, it's about how to set all that stuff as a level standard. So if there is a difference, you've probably actually got it already in, in a little bit of a problem, but probably a wider topic. Leo? Taking in the lead from Alex, uh, I think this is an interesting subject that we need to work on and it's a subject that I'd like to be discussing. I can see a lot of different things about how it works in different countries, how we work in different areas, and I'd like to be able to progress and look at the different advantages, get some feedback from people in different marketplaces. So we'll make sure that the panel contains people that know what's going to be happening there or that, that have got experience in there. But I think this is a big thing that we can push and help the 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 community to grow on nigel yeah i think i would add to that conversation how do you set objectives for people and for teams and how do you reward them how do you reward individuals how do you reward teams how do you use some of those tools when you can't you know walk around and slap on on the back and say well done yeah and i agree with um everything that's been said but then also there are different types of industry. So we do a lot of work with nonprofits and now you're dealing with volunteers and how you manage them and that process. I think that would be um, great for us to even break down even further the, like Leo said, countries and industries. Sky? Well, Liberty, you and I worked together uh, remotely and you and I have never met in person, but I feel like we, we share a lot of the same aspirations and, and goals, but also in doing production, there was an, an inventory of product that or a production equipment that you had. And in working with Jeff Keefley, I realized I was bringing a lot of specific tools to the party to s solve his solution and be valuable to him. So somehow there's also that management of what the tools are that you are good at and are bringing to the experience. Good point, Alex. Yeah. And I think that, um, there's probably a second hour there just to talk about working with volunteers. <laughs> like I think there's a, you know, as so we talk about business end of things, we can probably talk for a whole hour on just the, the process of how to do a production uh, with volunteers. Agreed. Next question. John Snyder in Reno, Nevada says, uh, what are some of the key differentiators you have implemented in your business that sets you apart from competition? Rupert? I uh, only use Zoom in HD. I won't use it any other way. And I retain all my ears and all my shoulders. And, and again, I just want to interrupt it. What we want to do is not try to answer the question, but really talk about it as a subject matter for what we're going to um, do. So we're not, we'll, we'll not try to answer the questions that are coming in here. These are just, I know they're coming in as questions, but I think that's kind of like a, you know, jeopardy issue. <laughs> so, so anyway, so the, uh, um, so, but I think that that as a, as a subject, I think would be, um, great. Yeah. So these will be a springboard for us to even think about it even further on how we could create a second hour around this. Yeah. Bill? Well, I, my comment was just going to be that all the differentiators looking back on my career that really set me apart from any of my comp competition. Again, I'm going to interrupt you. I just want to make sure we're talking to the what will we do in the future as a second hour, not try to answer the question itself. So I just want to make sure we're on the same page. Okay. So I may not understand this. So, I'll, yeah. I'll so I just want to make sure for the for the for this week, we're talking about when people put up a question, we're not trying to answer the question. We're talking about like trying to explain like what would we cover in that and what we would do. But all we're planning, all we're talking about no, in the second hours for the whole week, we're just talking about what subjects do we want for the rest of the quarter and into the next, into the year. Um, not, don't try to answer the specific questions. The questions are really about, about like the, the, anything posted here is us. Is this something we want to talk about as a second hour? And, and what will we add to it? So we, we already realized, oh, we should talk about how to manage the teams remotely. We should talk about volunteers. That's just another second hour. So we're discussing the subjects, not answering the subjects. Next, next. All okay. right, <laughs> Courtney. Yeah, one thing would be to, to discuss in a second hour uh, how to do competitive pricing and how to compete without destroying, uh, destroying the, the marketplace. Uh, so that would be an interesting topic on, on determining pricing, pricing for services and how you can in, and generate a competitive advantage uh, via pricing. Chris? Yeah, I think it's very uh, important to look carefully at things that you're interested in from a business standpoint 
um, to look at whether or not they have legs. And I think that as we look forward and look to um, stretching our own businesses, it's important to 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 look at that, you know. And I think it's a good discussion about you know how future proof are some of these ideas possibly. Good point, Noah. I Did I get it? Do. Did I get it, Alex? <laughs> <laughs> you, you, yes. Yes. <laughs> I think yes. we can do a whole second hour on reframing um, what we see as competition, right? Um, and I think one of the th great things about office hours, one of the things I'm drawn to and I love is the thought of collaboration over competition, right? We're all on the same team. Um, there's enough, more than enough work to go around to everybody. Um, and so just that whole concept of like reframing how we think about this question essentially. Bill? I think a discussion also of just the maintenance of client relationships. What you know, how what is going far enough? What is going too far? And how does that make you different than your competition? And what is appropriate in this new online world so that you build these relationships with your clients in a way that makes them stickier for you? Good point. Good point. And I think even looking at this question, the basis of it being a lot of times people start a business out of I do I'm really talented at being a camera op or whatnot but then when you actually get into the business side of it this could be an opportunity maybe business planning or market research or kind of um, digging into that a little bit that could be um, a way that we could attack this as well next question Next one comes from Lois Richter in Davis, California. She said, what story arc would we like to have for this year? Do we want to have some second hours built upon a previous second hour? Leo. Yeah, so I think this is a really good area that we could look at. Um, it would be nice to know exactly, uh, to have a list of all the second hours, maybe uh, to create something that people can vote on to say which one would they like to f take forward. Um, um, and, e and even what you look at when something that's changed so dramatically is three months or six months ago, how that has that story has changed quite a lot since that time. And so being able to I think this is something that I'd like to see the community get involved in saying, these were the top ones of the second hours. These are the ones that they were really interested in. And these are the ones that they would like to hear an update on. And it would be nice to get that feedback and uh, see what they think. Hmm, that update, that's a good, uh, good keyword there. Ari? Uh, when I looked at uh, this question, the word that popped out for me is uh, vision. And um, I think that we could do a second hour in, ter of, uh, in terms of visioning, uh, maybe do a, a vision board. We could address it from the point of view of uh, our personal vision for our business, uh, perhaps a vision for the industry, definitely a vision for the community, uh, things of that nature. Sky? Well, what stuck out to me, of course, is that, that Lois said story arc. You know, you had me at story arc because, Again, regardless of all of the equipment that we have, what we originally started with is a story. And so uh, I, I follow a belief of story first. And so I would love to continue a, a, a deeper dive of the different types of stories, because there's a difference between a narrative and a documentary and, a, and entertainment versus conversation. But again, how do we as humans connect with one another through our different stories? And I love that you mo also mentioned arc, which means there's a plan. There's a beginning, middle of an end of a thing. And Alex, I'm really excited about your, your quartering off and making measurable uh, expectations of, of these different goals, which is uh, just, I'm more excited than I was before. It's crazy. <laughs> Alex. Well, and that's, I think, kind of what I'm trying to do when we talk about story arcs of thinking about that we really start to think about different Monday, like the first Monday of every of everything is an artist, you know, is a musical artist. And the second one is someone that's going to talk about storytelling or talk about how they develop things. And a third one is a something, you know, like, so we talk about art in a different way on Thursdays, but each one is, has got its own little arc to it, um, as opposed to just something in that larger bucket. Um, there's some problems with that in the sense that it's harder to schedule to some degree, but there are advantages into that it's easier to come up with 12 ideas <laughs> instead of 50. So um, so you you kind of uh, can kind of think through that as well. Chris? If we look at stuff that's happened already in office and after hours, you know, we've seen, you know, Tuesdays has been this great collection of audio people. And you'll even hear people will say when they're logging on, oh yeah, you know, I wanted to be here because, you know, it's Tuesday. And regardless of how, um, or, you know, uh, education on Saturdays and cooking is now Sunday, I guess. So, um, but if you 
regardless of how careful you are in terms of like publishing what you plan on doing on any given day, those habits are more are much more powerful than a published schedule. And so as we plot out our story, um, I think that having those hard, fast, almost rules like Tuesday, audio, done. Um, it has a great way of getting like fringe people who don't pop in all the time, who probably aren't reading Office Hours at Global every morning as they roll over. Um, the travesty. It's, it is a travesty. Uh, but those habits are super powerful. You know, uh, I know when I was podcasting, I always, I always released a new show within about an hour of, you know, my published time, whatever. And it, the, it just helps people with their habits. Alex, oh, sorry. Yeah, and I think that the, the key is making sure that it's sustainable. One of the reasons, for instance, that we're combining video and audio is that it was hard for me to come up with video and audio subjects, um, you know, each week, <laughs> so of new ones. Um, so, uh, and and I felt like they were actually more related to each other. And the reality is, is that we uh, we had a really good collection of audio folks, and we still have a good collection on those Tuesdays. But it wasn't as it just became not as deep as it was before, um, where we had you know eight or nine people who were really deep into that process. Everyone just got busy. Um, and so it just became harder and harder for me to sustain. That was the, I mean, that's the reason that we're making the shift is that I had to keep on coming up with stuff. And again, it's easier for people to suggest what we do, but we have to, we ha when we think about these, these days, um, you have to think about, uh, number one, is that something that everyone will be interested in and that people can say what that is. And sometimes we take risks anyway, and, and we're surprised or not. Um, number two is is the company able to, can I get a hold of the company to have them do it or the individual? Um, so can I get a person to come for that day? Um, and when I, when, I, when I say that an appropriate person, someone who like, a good example is, um, I think that the folks from Parsec were gonna have just a salesperson come and I was like, this isn't the place for that. <laughs> like we need a technical person. And then they brought it. Like they brought a technical person that could answer all of our questions. But sometimes I can't get that from companies. So we have to, and it's not really worth our time to, to have a marketing person come talk to us, in my opinion. And so, so then I have to work through that. And then, you know, are they technically capable of doing it? Um, one thing that we're gonna become, as we go into this year, we're gonna become less and less understanding is, Companies cannot, like when I do a test or when we have a team that does a test with them over Zoom, if they're coming in over their laptop um, webcam and their laptop audio, we're not going to have them on. <laughs> like, 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 that's not, like, like, that's not going to, that's not going to fly anymore. And so, um, so that's the, uh, so those are the kind of things that there are a bunch of other logistical problems that we have with these. And so I need a little bit more room to work to make sure that we can achieve those. Next question. Guy. Oh, sorry. Just total last minute. It just kind of dawned on me that the evolution of the the AWS sessions was kind of like a a setup in use and then output. So it, having a three week thing, which the one that we did for AWS, I mean, a lot of you don't know, but we we, we were burning so the midnight good. oil. Uh, you know, we were rehearsing that thing. There yeah. was three of us in a breakout room. Sometimes five of us. And we're just, you know, going through it and going, do you really want to show that? Is that taking too long? You know, we had timers going and it got intense. But is there subjects like that where we want to spend three three weeks to me is a, is a, a nice round number. And it is an evolution. Like some of this stuff is just going to be changing so fast. You know, it's like what you said two weeks ago isn't going to be the same answer that you would give today. So it's, it's always evolving. I think that's the great thing about Office Hours. So I um, think when people... I, I, if it's okay, I talk again. <laughs> I think that if people... Uh, want to um if we have people that are willing to do that kind of work my what i always worry about is making sure we don't burn people out you know so that we have people who are you know putting a lot of time in and i want to make sure that we're not i mean i think that the aws is was an example some of the best second hours we've had um but i also think that there's there's also an opening for just i think having those i don't know if i want to do them three weeks in a row i think today i think about doing them th every fr like the last friday of every month you know, and then have the one before that or the one after that one be general Q&A about AWS. I mean, we're definitely going to talk about it, but I would spread it out over time a little bit more to let people absorb it, let people ask questions, let people, you know, that kind of thing, or or take the same subject and say, we're going to talk about something for 15 minutes or 10 minutes of un we're, to get back to the story arc that Lois and Sky were talking about is that we're going to work you through a project 
you know, there um, over time or talk about things over time. I also think we'll end up using after hours more for like, like the way we're using it for Isadora, you know, and you know, where we're going to just spend an hour nugging through it, you know, like all together. And I think that there's a power to that as well. So I think that using office hours for more than kind of that, we're all going to do it together and walk through it. And then the second hours is really a, we, we just want to make sure, I think that the best second hours for the most part, with the exception of AWS, which was really packed with a lot of information. The problem for me with the AWS ones, it was really, really good and it was really packed with information and I had a hard time absorbing all of it because I just didn't know enough. So after the first 15 minutes, I was, you know, my, my, uh, my cup ran it over, <laughs> you know, like, like, you know, so I didn't like, you know, so, so I was just kind of like, okay, I don't really like, I'll have to come back and watch this later. And so I think that looking at how do we set something up where we have 10 or 15 minutes of a presentation and really like the thing I'm going to really work on is 15 minutes is like the hard stop, you know, and, and, um, you know, for presentation. So when people design something, just design it for 15 minutes. But the goal of that 15 minutes is to expose someone to something new and to generate conversation, you know, and, and, and that's what we do. And, and, and so we're not trying to fill an hour of content. We're really trying to fill. And this is something that I, it took me a long time to learn. Uh, I, I've talked about this before, but I think it's um, pertinent to this conversation is that when I was on um, with uh, call for help and on before that on screensavers with Leo, I had seven minutes, you know, it was a seven minute window, six and a half, seven minute window. I used to try to pack 20 minutes into seven minutes. Like, how do I talk faster? How do I do da, 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 How do I do all this stuff? And I kept on trying to figure out, Bert Monroy and I had the same conversation because Bert was just like, he would just practice it over and over again and just be able to do it. But it was happening so fast, you couldn't understand what he was doing. What I learned to do was take a project and cut out all the extraneous stuff to where I could do it in three and a half minutes comfortably. So three and a half minutes comfortably. Now, what I could do is I could sit and have a conversation with Leo. Like I could just, I could show, and there's just a lot less steps. Oh, let me show you how to do this. And then I'm going to do this. And, and it was easier for me to prepare because there's a lot less to do. And it was easier for me to work through and it wasn't as fast. And so I think that that's when we think about the second hours, and we'll have a lot of conversation about the structure of them. What, I, what I'm going to hope that we do is really aim for that presentation to be seven to 10 minutes with a 15 minute hard out. And that's all we're going to, you know, like we're going to do that and then we're going to have a conversation. So anyway, that's, that's the way I would. That's the way I'm thinking about it right now, anyway. Next question. Next one comes from Sky Gleason here on the panel from Seattle. He says, crew call sheets. Are there other tools to create and distribute them other than as a PDF? This may be outside the boundaries of this conversation. So what I will say is that I, uh, and, and I, I think that for this conversation, Liberty, I might jump in and, uh, in and out a little bit more because we're kind of discussing it. But the, the um, uh, I think that call sheets is a great, Friday session, because that's really that's the kind of nuts and bolts that we're talking about, of like, you know, how do we ship stuff in? How do we build our call sheets? How do we build a management style for for those things? So I think that when we talk about like, how do we actually get something done, whether it's with AWS or call sheets or, you know, carnets, that's like a, in, in my eyes, and people can, you know, disagree with me, but that, in my eyes, that's the, that's a Friday session of like the kind of that nuts and bolts. Noah? I was just trying to think of like how to break this down into like building blocks. So for me, like a call sheet is compacting information, right? You're squeezing a lot of stuff onto a single sheet so it's easy mm -hmm. to read. So it's like we could break that down and talk about formatting and what is relevant information yep. to, to do that, right? Secondly is the evolution of the call well, sheet. And, of what, and oh, automation. Sorry, and automation mm -hmm. of the call sheets because we, we do a lot of automation. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 definitely. And then like the evolution of a call sheet of, you know, what, it, what it's used for, um, you know, 30 years ago versus mm -hmm. today. And um, when you have a big budget show versus a small budget show, um, as far as the distribution side of it goes, the, the digital format, right, of not having a paper copy that can't change, like maybe there's an active running call sheet. Um, but yeah, PDF is another, like it's just the standard right now to send that out um, because it's like a final finalized version of that call sheet. Ari? Well, other than the obvious answer then, uh, which is, uh, yes, uh, Google Sheets, of course. Uh, I think that there's a second hour here in procedural things, which are non-technical uh, in nature. Many, many things like this, tools and procedures, and that would be a wonderful second hour. Courtney? 
Yeah, I agree. Uh, a lot of productions these days are, are very concerned about security, and that would be another thing that the, how it relates to distribution of information amongst the crew. They're very paranoid about uh, releasing this information to the public, and so security tools that will secure this type. And there's, you know, like this, there's a six best production management software on this website here. That might be a good topic to, to look at production management software. There's a software tools available for film and television production that cover not only call sheets, but distribution of scripts, breakdowns, scheduling, and that kind of stuff. It's a, it's a whole topic of production software. Yeah, and that could be consistently, uh, maybe even quarterly, something like that. David? Yeah, um, early on in the pandemic, we looked at a few products like that trying to pivot into it there are some commercial ones that would make good topic of discussion but also um to think of a bespoke home brewed thing web-based with security much like mukana and all the layers of um barriers to entry is it i forget the, the term but you know whatever that may be could be a uh, leverage to our benefit and alex i think i already jumped in Okay, Sky. <laughs> yes, and so did I. I, I. When I asked this question an hour ago, I didn't realize. But I love that we're, we're thinking outside the box. Awesome. Thank you. Next question. And it comes from Liberty White in Atlanta, Georgia. The new year is a good time to go back to basics. What about an introductory series to film streaming and broadcast? And what other verticals would anyone add? Leo. So I would also add in uh, houses of worship because that's an area that is uh, uh, an area that a lot of us deal with. I'd also look at sport um, and I'd also look at some of the other things where there is, we have some key people who've got involved in different marketplaces. And I think sometimes when you see the application delivered in another marketplace, it really opens your eyes up to how those things can work in a different environment and what you can learn from that. And I think that's always been something that I found fascinating in the second hours. Noah? I love knowledge. There's so much knowledge. <laughs> um, IT, right? So that side of stuff is still foreign to me mostly. Remy production as a whole, um, company culture, um, and AWS for dummies like me. <laughs> Plus one on the company culture. Alex? Yeah, and I think co company culture would be a, a great one for the Mondays, and while Remy would probably be something that we try to aim on Fridays and AWS and so on and so forth. But I think that all of them are great subjects. I think that the intros to different styles, that, that, that one I have to think about a little bit about where that fits. I think Mondays is probably where that would fit um, into um, whether it's sports production or filmmaking or even, you know, bringing... I think it would be really fun to bring YouTubers on to talk about. We, we've interviewed a couple of YouTubers like Renee and, and a couple other and, you know, other folks, but having them on to talk about how they do their process, like how they approach it. And that's been traditionally on a Thursday, but it could also be just thinking about the business end of social media of like, how do they execute their business? It might be if for those that are willing to talk about it, um, that can be a really interesting one. Bill? I'm just going back to my early days with users groups back when I started first learning computers and it was interesting watching the arc of people coming in without knowing much the community gathering together everybody's knowledge increasing but at some point most of the people have been around for a long time now understand all the basics and so we always used to take a little bit of time at the beginning to bring the new people who were always coming in for whom the discussion was way too advanced and in doing that um, I think it really helped to not forget how that that process of onboarding people needs to be a little different than the onboarding or than the regular show. So it was useful back then. I don't know if there's any chance of doing something like that in the structure of office hours, but onboarding new people is can be a different thing. Very true. Sky? Well, again, outside of a theater, you would normally see the two drama masks of comedy and drama. And so I'm, I'm curious about these, as Alex said, the different styles of comedy, drama, musical uh lecture uh and again there's there's as many different categories that that we're not discussing that are not technical other than i watched an old transformer um uh, in a movie the other day lots of hard fast cuts because they were trying to create energy uh, in in tension in a kung fu movie and that's an entire style and a genre there too so the word style into this conversation is all the different categories of different styles rupert 
in terms of verticals and as we think about these different uh, ideas and planning for second hours maybe or just the quarter ahead it um, it's probably true that the saturday second hour is going to remain as education though and so we may want to also think about not not forget that as a vertical and if we are going to structure some content or you know find vendors or or guests or whatever it is to um remember that and not forget to um try and uh, line up some perhaps structured content or in introductory materials or pathways in for um, that part of the community also. Yeah, very good point. EdTech is a vertical in and of itself. Uh, David? Just thinking too about what Alex was saying, uh, a, a regular day where it could be built upon over the month. So Monday, day one would be basics of framing. Monday, week two could be basics of composition. It's, you know, those sorts of things. And then build upon it into different looks, be it sports or news or ENG or documentary filmmaking, et cetera, stuff like that. And that would help with our, our story arc, definitely. Alex? Yeah, two, two things. One is we probably break that up into once a month. So when we talk about composition for a certain thing, be the first Mondays or second Mondays or whatever, and then we do it an, a month later. And the reason for that is that almost every single time that we've done the same subject, including my most recently my little studio thing, uh, interest falls off after the first two. So, so you know, like it's just like oh, it's the same thing. You know, to people it'll, it'll be the same thing. And so by spreading it out a little bit, again, it thinks like I'm thinking kind of like a user group where let's break it up so that there it we're change like we change the subject all the time here. We're changing the subject all the time each week. You know, uh, on, you know, in that in that vertical, so that people have kind of a a different. Uh, look at, at the same subject matter. Um, as far as education, that's exactly what we're going to do at 10 o'clock on, on, you know, we're going to start broadcasting again for education and we're going to have technical, probably every other one of them is going to be technical. And then the other ones are going to be, we're going to try to bring speakers in. So speakers that are in ed tech to talk about what they're doing and, and everything else. And so it's really going to be more like a second hour, a traditional second hour, but there'll still be two hours of us kind of talking off air <laughs> and coming back up to, to, to make that happen. All right. Next question. Leo Mendel and Pinner in the UK here in the panel says, should we create a virtual roster of production pros to deliver events and office hours style LinkedIn, if you will? Rupert. Uh, I guess we could. I mean, the power of community is obviously pretty strong. I mean, we, we uh, tend to get to know, I guess, each other in the, in the community here, whether it be in the panel or in the, in the uh, after hours or even in, Discord. So I, th I think we're quite well connected. I'd just be cautious about trying to reinvent the wheel with, uh, you know, another LinkedIn or another network to try and, uh, you know, keep uh, up to date with. Out. So I just I want to make sure we were clear on what the sort of requirement and intent is and whether it's a, a value add. Alex? I think there's ways to make that highly effective. Um, and it wouldn't that wouldn't uh, um, reproduce, reinvent the wheel. Um, so I think that talking, I, well, in general, from a, like, how do we plan Mondays? I think talking about networking is, is, is a really, really useful one. How do you meet new people? Um, as far as how to build something else, uh, it's, def it's definitely something I think it would be safe to say that if you looked at the old pixel core stuff, it's definitely something I thought about a lot. And, uh, so, um, so anyway, I, I think that there's a lot of opportunity there. I, th I don't think we're quite mature enough f to turn that on yet, but, uh, I think we will soon enough. Next question. Noah Sargent in Fullerton, California up next with, could we talk about business fundamentals, small business structure, taxes, marketing, clients, relations, HR, and so forth? Nigel? I, I, obviously we can. I think I, I know what I've enjoyed most about office hours and that's where it's given a context where somebody did something, where somebody's achieved something. So it was less educational, I'm now going to teach you all about marketing, and more listening to someone who used some of these skills to help them build a business. So I would encourage us to try and keep that context in place. Good point. Leo? Yeah, and building on what Nigel said, I mean, there, there's a lot of people out there that can talk to you about the certain skills, big skills. And I just wonder if we start drifting into this, we will lose focus on what we're actually, what our core fundamentals are. Um, and also you've got to bear in mind that a lot of those, uh, many of those things are dependent upon the marketplace that you're in. So you're going to lose uh, a lot of uh, people when you start talking about different parts of that, because it won't be relevant. 
Yeah. And as long as we, like you said, focus on the context of the folks that we're serving, the community that we're serving, um, hopefully that will be helpful to many. Rupert? Yeah. And, and we would want to be careful that, um, you know, some, there are some sensitive subjects in there. So I'm sure there'd be uh, plenty of sources of opinion and conversation, but that wouldn't want to be confused with, you know, guidance or advice in some of those sensitive areas. And we'd also want to make sure that we are um, creating an environment where we don't, we're not going to create an environment where somebody may say something by mistake, particularly in a uh, live environment. Ken? Yeah, I'm not following what um, Nigel and others have said on this, I think this is much more of a after hours, maybe kind of subject. I mean, some of the basic fundamentals, yes, maybe in a, for a second hour, but I think um, a lot of these work better when people give real examples of how it works for them or what they're not working for them. And some of those subjects might not be something you'd want to, you know, recorded. Courtney. Yeah, I agree. The, the problem uh, is, Legal liability varies from country to country and even state to state as far as, you know, hiring practices and labor relations and uh, and even business practices, business structure varies from country to country and state to state. So it'd be tough to kind of do a universal discussion of this or best practices when oh, something you suggest may be illegal in another country uh, or another state. Sky? I had... I hadn't, I was so positive about, yes, I need this information too, Noah, that I hadn't thought of these other collateral damage issues that, that these other wise people have brought up. And the word that I want to bring to this conversation is, is, uh, accountability groups. And Alex, you talked about your pixel core teams going down and then having an accountability of creating a thing, but also a structure by which to have a, uh, a, a coach that is a specialist in a field, but the whole accountability as far as, you know, telling you how to do something and then being liable for it. I, wow. I hadn't even thought of that. Bill. Yeah. I, I, very, just very briefly. I support what Courtney and others have said. It, it's, we have to remember we're global. We're, we're touching people's lives who are everywhere and they don't all follow the same rules that I might hear in Southern California. So. Okay. Next question. Next one comes from Noah Sargent in Fullerton, California. Could we talk about transitioning from freelancer to business owner and what to look out for? Rupert? I think we certainly could. I think it would be um, worthwhile. I think it could be widened maybe a little bit in the transitions between, you know, different types of employment, maybe working from big business to going to a smaller company, being freelance, building your own business, and also the exit strategy of building your own business, you know, are you going to sell it? Are you going to get acquired? Are you going to retire on it? Or, you know, just the, the stepping stones between each of those uh, different phases and, uh, you know, sources of work and employment. I think that would be a, a good uh, wider discussion. Ken? Again, I think partly related to the previous question, the um, basic fundamentals, yes, perhaps in the second hour, but again, I think things like this work really well when, you know, you people can relay their own story of their journey and then talk about that um, with others or, and again, whether how much of that would want to be um, in office hours and much more easier to deliver in something like after hours, I think. Leo? I'll take that slightly further. I think this is much better subject to be done in Tony Mobley and something like this, uh, subjects where you can actually talk about the personal involvement of people and you get the story out that way and you can see the, how the relationship of everything builds. Everybody has a different story and everybody has a different path into this. And I think if you try and bring this into, you know, office hours is much more about how to do something. Um, and the Tony Mobley conversations are much more about how something came about and how it evolves. And I think that would be a subject that I'd like to see there where you can actually understand the personal, because there's stuff in there that's, that's about the personal, how you do it, how, you know, the sleepless nights and all the things we've all gone through. I'd like to see it there rather than in here. Guy. Yeah, I think the format that we've had where it's like 15 minutes of uh, a demo and then discussion or Q and a at the beginning at the, in, in the middle or intersperse in, in a lot of ways we we can watch the numbers in the back end we can see or you guys can see it as attendees as well you can see how many people are here so if you start doing irrelevant topics uh, people jump so in this regard uh, some people are enterprises i look through the the people that are in attendance i can see um, that a lot of them wouldn't would want 
to go down the small business um, topic for very long because it's irrelevant to them. So I think we need to really keep in mind relevance, and that's with the Discord, with voting on those second hour topics. If if it's in there, you know, our audience votes, and they say, you know, yes, uh, you know, when you start to see lots of hearts or thumbs up, uh, that's what we go for. Yeah, good point. And this is a brainstorm, so this allows us to throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. Alex? I do think that there'd be a, a, a good subject there somewhere around thing. I think that we could have one things I wish I knew when I started a business. Cause you know, a lot of us that had, that, that have had our own company did it kind of by accident. Like it wasn't like a, you know, there's some people that start it and you raise money and then you have a corporation and then you do the thing. But a lot of us just were a freelancer and then we're hiring lots of people and then stopped hiring freelancers and started hiring employees. And it was, you know, it, there was, it was a much more organic thing. And then a lot of us got into it and wished we had done a bunch of other things. So I think there could be a second hour of for the business owners just to talk. Again, I don't think it's something you'd come back to over and over and again, but I think that there's a second hour that a bunch of people would show up. And, and the thing to remember is, is that one of the things I'm looking at and the reason I'm trying to create as much diversity as possible between week to week is that every second hour, what I am learning is people are habit driven to go, oh, I'm going to do that. But, but actually the number one driver uh, of attendance is what we put into that email. Like I'm just, let, I can just tell you that, you know, the email that goes out to everyone every day, number one impact. And if it doesn't, if that doesn't call to people or they're not interested, um, they don't come, you know, and, and they don't, uh, they don't show up even for the first hour. I notice it all the time. Like, oh, I'll just go, oh, that was a bad subject. <laughs> like, so I measure it all the time. Like, like so if you see, see me not do things, even though people voted on them, it's because we did one like that and it was a disaster. And, and um, you know, like we had 112 people, you know, that, at, at, you know, in, in the middle of the thing, you know, that's to me, that's like a, that's like a, oh, we won't do that again kind of moment. Um, and so, uh, uh, so the, um, so I think that what I'm looking at is the ability, because one of the things that we're going to be doing over this month is launching the Twitter account and the face, you know, like th the different accounts that we need so that we can let people know what's going on. And the idea is, is that people will make decisions because in the, I won't, I can't announce every single one of these on my own Twitter account. There's just too many followers that aren't interested in what we're doing, but I can't have an account that I recommend people go to. And <laughs> then you get the, right when we start, like, hey, this is what we're covering. This is, you know, there's, you know, and, and, and that type of thing. So I think that um, what I'm hoping to do is, is increase the diversity of and increase the number of people coming from di for different things. So each, you know, some people are going to come every single morning, but some people are going to come because of that thing that we're talking about and that they're going to come in and some of them will stay and some of them will go and new people will come in because we're talking about that. Um, so, I mean, we had, we had an event last Wednesday that added hundreds and hundreds of people <laughs> to, to our group. So, so that was, uh, that's a, uh, kind of, uh, changes the, the straw. So do more of that is what we're trying to figure out. And Rupert. I, I was just circling back thinking, trying to envision what subjects might suit what formats, whether it's Tony Mobley or second hours or after hours or whatever. Some some of these subjects, I, I don't know whether whether they may suit a pre-record, you know, interviewed format that people can go back and watch, particularly on the sensitive areas where people might want to just double check the things that they um, they say. Maybe there's an opportunity there. I'm not sure. Okay, next question. Next one comes from Thomas Bauer in Atlanta, Georgia. Is it possible to have a Mukana like voting process for future topics so that we can see the interest in them? Sam. Uh, yeah, I think that would be a, a good idea. And Ken? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's the, uh, I do look at the, um, I think Alex rang on the earlier question about when subjects are come on and see what interest is spiked because uh, I can see the website stats obviously um, and yeah we can do something well not maybe more long term because obviously Makana is very much more instant so maybe perhaps on the website having a bigger um, a more long term kind of voting so not just on the instant so make them last for the whole week that we can then see what people's interests are that's okay. Alex yeah. And as I said before, sometimes there's a lot of logistics that are connected to it that that make even something that's highly voted on not something that we can do immediately. A lot of times I'll come back to it and try to figure it out. We do need a better way of kind of organizing that where 
maybe again, what Ken suggested on the website so that I can see things persistent over a long period of time that people are voting on, that we finally turn into a subject um, based on the right person in the right place. Uh, we have the right person to cover it or talk to it. Sometimes it's just like, I don't know if we have the people that morning to cover that subject, you know, and so those are the things that we have to kind of um, figure out you know, as far as is as, as how we look at it. So there's a lot more to it than voting, um, but I would like to get more response, um, especially uh, this next quarter, I'm trying to just, I'm trying to get it all scheduled this week. <laughs> so so the um, that's what we're doing, you know, what, one of the reasons we're doing this, and then I can properly, I just keep on, there's a whole bunch of logistics that I keep on getting pushed out and I got to hand it off to a team. And as we hand it off to the team to do that, um, we want to have more voting so people, they have a guide to it. I will say that I have added many, probably 10 to 15 subjects that I didn't think would work because they were voted on heavily in the second hour um, suggestions uh, and they worked. You know, so I, I, I have a lot of faith in if there's over 10 people that have voted on something, I'll do everything I can to put it in, um, you know, to, because it's, uh, there's enough people to that I've decided there's probably critical mass there. Okay. And... Ken and Alex, I, I like the evaluation that if it's on the website, then it's it kind of removes the personality of the the question, and so or who's asking the question, and that sometimes is a prejudice that 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 happens. So uh, I like the voting and, and that. Go ahead. And to be clear, I think it'll be some it'll be somewhere on the website. It'll either be protected or it'll be in Discord, mostly because I don't want just anybody going by the website to vote. I don't really care what they think. I'm sorry. <laughs> like, like I just, define, define that. <laughs> like I, I don't until they become a member of what we're doing. Until they've gone through the work to be part of the community, um, I'm not really interested in their opinion. Like you know, like you know, like that's the. I mean, just just to be totally flat. So that we speak the same like, language, have the well, same. They've experience. just done the work. You know, like if someone hasn't isn't willing to show up at a certain time of day to get into Discord, I have I have a limited um, a limited interest in in what they think. You know, so, so like just to be clear, like uh, and and this is something that. We learned in politics a long time ago is that you you tend to the core <laughs> like you know like don't you tend to the core is what we tend to call it you don't you don't you do things that are get people's attention that's wider but the the primary you always need to have your the, your, your primary interest on your your core uh, membership you know and so you, it's easy to get to try to spread out and you, then you you lose that but uh but it's been, you know, for the last 25 years, that's been the hallmark of a lot of things. And so in the same way that we, you know, I'm interested in definitely getting out to more people and having more people. I don't think that the problem is that, we, that we're too hard to get into or that anything else is there. We just haven't gotten enough people to know about us, you know. And, but what I'm not interested in is trying to get a higher percentage of them to join. I'm trying to get out to a, n a larger number of people and then make it and to keep on getting a more, you know, but keep on getting a kind of a, this um, extract of that group, but keep that percentage the same, that we're very focused on what we're doing in the way that we're focused, it's, which is kind of an unfocused sort of way. But we just get the reach out further and then keep on building that core up. And just as a reminder to our producers to go ahead and voting, speaking of voting, go ahead and vote on the remaining questions that we have so that we can make sure that we can get to them. All right, next question. Next one comes from Jochen Behrens in Delft, the Netherlands. He said, my perception of office hours is an unstructured wealth of information, expertise, and knowledge. Is there any consideration or desire to create more structured content, such as specials, courses, or workshops created collaboratively? Noah? Yeah, that's a good question. And when you look at office hours, you can definitely say that, or, or it's seemingly unstructured. I think over time, um, these thematic things that are happening, like you know, Monday's business, Tuesday's audio, et cetera, are helping shape that structure. Um, another thing that I think would be helpful is the thought of um, combining or, or grouping subjects or themes to get thematic th um, things together around the metadata that comes with either the questions or specific words. And I'm sure Alex could talk to that as well. Um, but finally, another thing that we might consider doing is um, having a volunteer volunteers help uh, uh, bring those things together as well so that you have thematic videos that are basically highlights of those questions or things within a series of questions that have been asked. Sam, Sam. Oh uh, uh, yeah, I, I totally agree with that. But, but also I think that the proposal of doing courses is an, an interesting idea because 
the office hours format is good for de- for developing relationships and it's and and I find it easy easiest to learn from people who I've developed relationships with. Great. Alex? Yeah, and and I think that um a lot of classes as as a guy talked about with the AWS is that a lot of those classes are a lot of work, you know, to put those things together. And so um, I think that what we want to do, like just those second hours was a lot of work, but for us to think about specific courses and, and, and so on and so forth, I think that I'm going to be interested in trying to figure out ways that we can pay for those classes to happen. So it'll be a slightly different setup. Um, we may have some that are, um, that we've kind of tried to figure out, but I think that one of the things that I'm really looking at is, the idea that we will um, uh, possibly have like a Saturday session that's four hours long on photography or something, but that'll be a, a paid class that people can choose to do, but that helps pay for the studio and the person, the expert and everything else. I think that there'll be some things that are volu- uh, um, you know, volunteer status and some things that are, are, are paid for. And I think that that's going to be something that we, we start to kind of grow towards um, because we, it just takes too much infrastructure to do it otherwise. And Ken? Oops, I read it. My mic was open all that time. Sorry about that. Um, there is actually quite a um, bit of structure that's already there. I mean, it is, um, and someone has been cataloging it um, for the website. It's uh, There is quite a bit of structure that we do have. It's not, might, be, might not be shown to the front, um, be as visible as it can be. But um, yeah, I think the, the, the structuring of the content that we have does group probably quite well from from what I've gone through and kind of catalogued um, our daily shows. Okay, next question. Next one comes from Greg. It looks like Grichmeyer in Topping, Virginia. With so many second hour topics coming up, should a third hour be added to the mix versus punting over to after hours? Alex. There may be some day where we add more hours, um, but this year will all be about two hours. <laughs> like so, so we're not gonna uh, we're we're gonna try to make the two hours that we do better um, before we start making more of them. And so, um, office hours two point is a big piece of that, where we're gonna really focus on turning that into something that looks like a broadcast show. Um, and then, uh, so I think that that's that's really what we're kind of playing against. Making it longer will make it harder for us to sustain. And what we want to do is make it more dense. Um, you know. If, at the moment. Um, uh, yes. Do I think that we could have a 24 <laughs> seven network that just did this and had different second hours and discussions? Absolutely. Uh, we're not at the size yet to sustain that yet, both in infrastructure and viewership and a whole bunch of other things. And so there's, you know, plenty of hours. And one of the things I wanted to do is get out here and just get those stirring up for each day. Um, today has been super useful as far as me figuring, thinking through that, that process. Um, and, uh, we'll keep on doing that this week, but I think that we're going to still stick with that and then use after hours again as the overflow. And, um, I guess I would say more deliberative where it's much more after hours. A lot of the sessions are slower and they're not, you know, they're not changing all the time. They're just kind of a slow discussion of working through something. And I, which I, I think is just a different way and in some, in some ways, a superior way to do it in some ways, not really in the same vein. All right, Leo. Yeah, so this is one of those things where we're answering a direct question in this this session. Um, I think it's always uh, quality over quantity. Um, And in my experience that when I've done this and other things that I do, um, when you start expanding and you start running longer and longer and longer, the quality goes off. Um, And some of the shows that I do with Tobias, who was here earlier, you know, we found that if we actually boil it down and make the show shorter, cut it off, learn when to say goodbye Uh, you actually get a better show than if you keep going on and i think there's enough good subjects that you can just keep going the subjects each day rather than trying to put more subjects on in each day good point courtney uh yeah and if you the the idea of going to a third hour i would try and like to find out some way to do and it may be much more difficult to do with office hours 2.0 because of the automated structure is to be able to change the panel at the hour you know if we're going to discuss specific topics in a specific hour that the composition of the panel needs to change just like on education days where the panel changes at eight o'clock 
So to set up some mechanism to bring new panelists in, whereas rather than just have attrition amongst the panelists that are there at 642 in the morning to join the panel for that day. So there has to be some method of bringing new people in for specific hours that have that area of expertise. If I'm not talking about the guests that are going to be speakers for that particular second hour topic or so on, but I'm just talking about the panel. If they're going to answer questions on a specific topic, uh, it might be wise to figure out some way to bring in experts just for that hour uh, into the panel itself. David? Uh, and there's only so many hours in the day. I think the after hours format is a good incubator for these things. If you just look at OH space and the birding project, etc., cetera, um, they started as conversations there and they've grown legs and are uh, developing at uh, breakneck speeds on all fronts. All right. Thank you. We're going to speed through the remainder of these. We're, yeah, we're, we'll just do two more questions. And oh, we'll, just two more? Yeah. And uh, we're, we're out of time. We're over time and <laughs> I, I'm already late for something else. So, well, I'm going to, I'm going to talk a little bit at the end. I mean, we'll, we'll go into after hours and then I got to hand it off by 930. So uh, anyway, so we'll just do two more questions. We are going to, we're not kicking these questions back to everyone, just so you know, because I'm going to go through them later and put them into my notes um, of suggestions. And so while we didn't discuss it, everything that you put in is going to be useful for me to kind of look at um, as we go forward. Okay, Guy, next question. Next one's coming in from Fred Eric Eckert in Bad Hair in Old Germany, and he asks how to build up a service around high-end office communication. Also says setting up one-person studios, remote service to run them, delivering formats for different use cases, marketing, in-house marketing, et cetera. Alex. I think that's a kind of a mixture between Mondays and Fridays. So the setting up of the technical setting up of the of the studios and everything else, I think, is a Friday discussion. While the like, what are the opportunities for that are kind of a Monday. So and that could get into the when we talk about story arcs, it could be something that we talk about building studios on Friday and what we could do with them on Monday. You know, so that those things could kind of um, you know sit back to back as well. Okay. Next question. Next one is in from Douglas Carmichael, and he says, what would you think of a second hour about managing and working with those on the autism spectrum or other challenges? Leo. I always like it when we do things about diversity and learning how to deal with things. Uh, none of us are experts at any of this, uh, or there are lots of people who are experts at various different things. Um, I, I recently covered some stuff um, about how to deal with deaf people on these sort of things and it's just an incredible experience to actually learn and understand it from the other point of view how people uh, see and what you're dealing with um, and I think this would be a great one to be covering and understanding what's the right thing what's not the right thing am I too loud I'm too quiet is my pit is my screen wrong is everything like that just so that I can uh, adjust to uh, fit Sam yeah that would be a great idea and Ken yeah, um, accessibility isn't just a subject for people on whatever spectrum. It actually makes almost everything you do. I know in my work, everything I do, because of you know, the conversation I had with Laura and others, it makes work you do better. You know, So it's not just about, oh, I need to cover this because of people on this spectrum or that. It actually makes what you build and what you produce and when you even when you're thinking about it on what you need to cover better for everybody. So yes, that, that as a section, as a, um, as a monthly or whatever um, timing, I think is a, is a really, is a really valuable um, for everyone. Definitely. Alex. Yeah, we're definitely going to be doing some version of accessibility every month. So there'll be, there'll be one month, one Friday of every of every month that, that it'll be Fridays month most likely where I'll put accessibility because it's kind of a nuts and bolts of how to get something done. And but captioning, audio description, autism, all these things are things that we should be covering, um, you know, and, and kind of working through it because they're they're very intricate. All of them are very, you know, the um, you know, we went from not knowing anything. I had to do a couple hundred events with, um, uh, um, you know, um, uh, sign interpreters. And we went from not knowing anything to having a very specific need <laughs> of, of how they did it and how we set them up and how we prepared for the prepared it and how and how they hand things off. And so having some of them come on and talk about that and, or, or, or communicate that with us is going to be important. So I think that autism is, is definitely a, a great one for us to include in that in that mix. 
and I think we've we've run to the end. Yes. So so anyway, so thank you so much. I, this is going to be a fun week. I think this is going to be actually a really fun week as we kind of brainstorm um, a lot of these different subject matters that are not just going to affect, I think, the rest of the quarter. And please leave your questions in there. I know that we put them all in there. Um, leave them in the voting area because I'm going to go through after the show and pull pull everything out to make sure that I, I have the newer, newer ones in there. But I think this is going to help us for the whole year as far as figuring out what uh, – what we're kind of what subject matters we're going to cover and i just i think it's really useful for me to kind of think through that um, and, and the team that will be taking a lot of that over so thank you to the producers for um, all the great comments and questions and thanks to our uh, to our panelists of course great first hour great second hour great discussion thanks to liberty uh for uh for hosting it's good to have you and uh I love not hosting. <laughs> I'm learning. You know, like I love sitting there like in, and, and and having Liberty take over and, and be able to kind of look ahead and do things and and, and so um so thank you so much Liberty for uh taking a little weight take, taking a little of the weight and doing such a good job. Thanks. I enjoy being here. Um and uh thanks to everybody and we will now jump to uh after hours. My button isn't working. Bye bye.